committee will now come to order. Today we welcome Kevin McAleenan, the Acting Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, along with Chip Fulgham, the Acting Undersecretary for Management. Thank you both for being here this morning. Mr. Secretary, the past several weeks have been eventful for you and the department. You and your hand have had your hands full as a CBP commissioner, and now you are responsible for ensuring the smooth functioning of the entire Department of Homeland Security. Your service as a career CBP employee brings an important credibility to your new position. Right now, this credibility is sorely needed, and it will be severely tested as you navigate your way through extremely controversial waters. Most of today's hearing will likely focus on immigration enforcement and the challenges at the border. Therefore, let me take a moment to recognize the dedication and the commitment of the men and women of the Department of Homeland Security who carry out the other vital missions that help protect the American public and our country from a wide range of threats. This includes DHS personnel who assist Americans following natural disasters, defend against cyber attacks, secure our airports, and investigate child exploitation and trafficking. The subcommittee will continue to work with you to ensure they have the resources that they need to carry out their important missions. This weekend's horrific terrorist attacks targeting religious minorities were a, re were a reminder that we must remain vigilant against the growing threat of domestic radicalization. I note that you recently announced the establishment of an Office of Targeted Violence and Terrorism Prevention. This office will help states and local communities counter the broad array of violent extremism in this country, including the growing threat from white nationalist groups. With regards to immigration enforcement and the challenges that we face at the border, my hope is we can work together to find a balance between protecting our borders and preserving our American values, which so far have been lacking in this administration. As we ensure the integrity of our borders, we must also treat immigrants with dignity and due process. And, we, and as we enforce immigration law, we must also use the discretion inherent in the law to prioritize enforcement efforts. We must also help facilitate the ability to enter the United States through legal means while understanding the devastating circumstances that often compel desperate people to seek safe haven any way they can. Above all, we must not demonize those who, like so many of our ancestors, came to this country to seek a better life. A few weeks ago, I, along with several other members and staff, traveled to El Paso and San Diego to see CBP and ICE operations. What we witnessed, to say the least, was extremely disturbing. We saw families waiting to be processed who were kept for hours in the hot sun or in crowded makeshift shelters. We saw dozens of single adults standing shoulder to shoulder in Border Patrol holding cells designed for only 10 to 12 people. I understand that the surge of migrant families is unprecedented, but it is not an excuse for the conditions that we saw. I am aware that you are working to improve those conditions, but people are suffering and improvements are not happening fast enough. Addressing the humanitarian crises in short term is in part a resource challenge, but it is also a challenge that requires a commitment by your department to respect the rights of immigrants and to treat them humanely. Unfortunately, that is not what I and other members of Congress see during our many oversight visits. I hope we can continue to work together to ensure this challenge is met. For the long term, we will need to find solutions that provide migrants with real alternatives to making the dangerous journey north. In the meantime, 
while ensuring due process for migrants, the timeline for adjudicating immigration cases must be reduced. Simply making it harder to claim asylum in the United States is not the answer. Furthermore, the migrant protection protocols do not achieve the balance that we need, and they are making it harder for migrants to seek asylum in the United States. And unfortunately, efforts to ensure the safety and civil rights of migrants so far appear to be only an afterthought. To make matters worse, just last night, the President directed you and the Attorney General to adjudicate all asylum applications within 180 days, except in exceptional circumstances. To require a fee for asylum applications and a fee for asylum seekers to receive work authorization and to deny work authorization to asylum seekers who cross between the ports of entry. Mr. Secretary, as the head of the Department of Homeland Security, you will set the tone and establish the rules that will guide the department in meeting our shared goals of protecting our homeland and protecting our American values. I look forward to working with you and the members of the subcommittee to fairly, justly, and humanely address the challenges at our borders and the other many challenges facing the department across its many critical missions. The President's memo is another tragic step in the wrong direction. Now, before turning uh, to the Acting Secretary for um, his summary of his written statement, the full text of which will be put into the hearing record, uh, I would like to recognize our distinguished ranking member, uh, Mr. Fleshman, for any remarks he may have. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and for everyone involved, I do want to thank you for the tremendous courtesies and civil and cordial way that we have been able to work on these issues. There, uh, There's a lot of common ground, and there were some bona fide differences, but uh, I thank you for all these courtesies. Um, thank you, Mr. McAleenan and Mr. Fulgham for being with us here today, uh, for meeting with us on the Department of Homeland Security's fiscal 2020 budget request. I also want to specifically, Mr. Secretary, thank you for stepping into this role and leading this department. There's a lot to consider in the entirety of the department's budget. I'm grateful that the chairwoman has held individual budget hearings with the individual agencies within the department as best as our schedule would allow. There's a lot of great work being done across the department. We've heard from the Coast Guard and the TSA. FEMA is later this afternoon and CISA is tomorrow. We've had very informative meetings with ICE and CBP. It is clear that the people at the department are working every day to keep our country safe. Every leader from the department I've met with shares the same message. The people in their agencies are the most dedicated and committed to the mission of protecting our country. Please pass along our thanks for the work they're doing around the clock every day, sir. However, the situation we're seeing at our southwest border is really what's front and center these days. It is affecting the entire nation. It's pulling resources within the CPB, as we're seeing with wait times at the various types of ports within the department, and I'm sure that you are looking at reprogramming options, and I'm sure there aren't many. And across of all government from also high priorities, it's straining the resources and abilities of the NGOs, in our country and in Mexico. It was the pin in the revolving negotiations around the partial shutdown of our federal government. I am hopeful that together, both sides of the aisle and both sides of the Capitol, we can come to an agreement and a solution. But this is a budget hearing. So focusing on the department's budget request of almost $52 billion in net discretionary funding I think there's many places where we can agree. Resources for border security, technology, humanitarian aid, increases for cybersecurity and research, investment in the Coast Guard assets, and FTE investments to improve trade, travel, investigations, and enforcement. We all know the $5 billion requested for the physical border barrier will remain a challenge. We are up to it. 
Mr. Secretary, I think you have demonstrated a need for it. I look forward to your testimony on the Department's proposed investments and initiatives, and I thank you for being here. Madam Chairwoman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Fleshman. Uh, and just a quick reminder to members that uh, they will be called for questioning um, based on the seniority in which they, uh, 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 the uh, hearing started. And, um, and also, uh, please try and keep within the, the five minutes. Uh, we have a lot of questions, and I do appreciate the fact that the, the Secretary has agreed to stay longer than the two hours that we originally uh, had scheduled. And now uh, I would like to, uh, to turn to uh, the Chair of the Full Appropriations Committee, Ms. Anita Lowy. Thank you so, ma so much, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like to thank Chairwoman Roybal Allard and Ranking Member Fleischman for holding this hearing. And I thank you, Mr. Secretary, and our witnesses for joining us today. The Department of Homeland Security's mission to secure our nation from consistent and pervasive threats is not an easy one, and I understand that. We know this all too well in New York. To keep us safe, different components within DHS must effectively coordinate and cooperate, all while working closely with other federal, state, and perhaps most importantly, local and tribal agencies. That is why the chaotic state of the Department of Homeland Security is so troubling. It seems like the car is driving off the cliff with no one to take the wheel. Although I guess, Mr. Secretary, you are now the driver. Congratulations. It's even been reported that your predecessor, Secretary Nielsen, was so wary of angering President Trump that she tiptoed around addressing Russian hacking and interference in our elections so as not to ignite his no collusion anti Mueller ire. I must tell you that issue keeps me awake at night, and I truly worry about it, and I hope it's a major focus of your work. I hope that when it comes to one of the biggest threats our country and democracy faces, you will focus on this with a laser beam. Your predecessor also instituted cruel and inhumane policies of ripping children from their families, which you helped implement. I want to be very, very clear, and I think it's important that we understand this on both sides of the aisle today. Ensuring the integrity of our borders and enforcing immigration is difficult but necessary jobs, and we understand that. This administration's politicization of border security and heartless obsession with aggressive immigration enforcement are un-American and unacceptable. And you have an opportunity to turn it around and work with the Congress to humanely and ethically secure our borders. And we understand that we have to work together in a bipartisan way to secure our borders. Turning to fiscal year 2020, the budget request asks for an outrageous increase in ICE operations and support, including more than 1,000 additional ICE agents and support positions and a large increase in detention beds. These increases leave too much flexibility for ICE to support this administration's overly aggressive interior enforcement policies. Democrats simply will not provide these dangerously high levels of detention
for an agency that has remained opaque and whose enforcement tax tactics are unbalanced. ICE should prioritize removal efforts on those with serious criminal histories, not those who have lived and worked peacefully in our communities for decades, or those who are fleeing unspeakable violence in hopes of safety and a better future. The budget also proposes a large cut to the preparedness grants programs, including a $214 million decrease for the Urban Areas Security Initiative, which assists high threat, high density urban areas where the consequences of attacks would be most catastrophic. That also includes a $193 million cut to the State Homeland Security Grant Program, which enhances local law enforcement's ability to prevent and respond to acts of terrorism and other disasters. State and local jurisdictions, like those in my district, cannot effectively plan for the worst when support from their federal partner is inconsistent or insufficient. These programs need adequate funding to keep our communities safe. This committee, I want to assure you, is eager to support the department's essential and complex missions. But we cannot do that at the expense of, expense of state and local preparedness or our American values. So, Mr. Secretary, I look forward to a discussion today, and I thank you for being here. We will have a lively discussion, I'm sure. Thank you very much. And now I would like to turn to the distinguished ranking member of the full committee, Ms. Granger. Today, uh, to present the fiscal year 2020 budget for the Department of Homeland Security. You recently assumed an enormous responsibility as acting secretary of the department, but you're also assisted by a dedicated workforce working tirelessly to protect our nation, and I commend their efforts and your commitment to the department's mission. In my home state of Texas, we have an, a very important relationship with neighbors to our south. In many border towns and cities, our history and our economy, our families and our culture are very intertwined. And I've traveled to the southern border many times during my lifetime. Unfortunately, we have a humanitarian and security crisis on our hands, which I've been able to see for myself firsthand on two very recent trips to the border. The facts are undeniable and the strain on our system is unsustainable. There are record-breaking numbers of people coming mainly from Central American countries, but also from places around the world. I was told on the last trip, 51 countries coming across, people coming across our southern border through Mexico to our border. Unauthorized border crossings are now at a 12-year high. You know that. More than 100,000 people come to the border. They came 100,000 people in March alone. That's compared to approximately 400,000 in all of last year. As more migrants claim asylum, the pressures on the system will continue to rise. Homeland Security agencies have a staggering workload, and the immigration courts, which are already facing a backlog of up to five years, will become even more overwhelmed. Unfortunately, members of this committee can't solve this problem with funding alone. We need policy solutions as well, and we have to work together with our colleagues on the authorizing committees to make changes to immigration laws. I hope members can come together in a bipartisan way to address these very difficult issues. I know you have decades of experience with Customs and Border Patrol, and we thank you for being willing to serve the country in this new role. Your insights were extremely helpful as we completed the fiscal year 2019 appropriations process, 
And we look forward to continuing that partnership as we make funding decisions for this year. I thank you and I thank Madam Chairman. I yield back. Okay, Mr. S uh, uh, Secretary, on our trip to the border earlier this month, we witness uh, migrants continuing to be held in inhumane conditions. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so anxious to get to the questions because we have so many. Please continue, uh, continue with your opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, Chairwoman Royball Allard, uh, Ranking Member Fleischman, uh, Full Committee Chairwoman uh, uh, Nita Lowy, and Ranking Member Kate Granger, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to testify before you today. Uh, it, it's a true honor to serve as the acting secretary and to represent the distinguished men and women of the Department of Homeland Security. In my view, uh, DHS has the most compelling mission in government to safeguard the American people, our homeland, and our values. As acting secretary, I intend to work with this committee and serve as an advocate for the men and women of the department to ensure they have the resources they need to carry out critical missions on behalf of the American people. And today I have the privilege of presenting to you the President's fiscal year 2020 budget request for the Department of Homeland Security. The 2020 budget would strengthen the security of our nation through enhanced border security, immigration enforcement, cybersecurity, transportation security, counterterrorism, and resilience to disasters. With regard to border security, as you're all aware, we're in the midst of an ongoing security and humanitarian crisis at our southwest border. The department, at the request of our frontline officers and agents, has worked with the to make clear that we need additional resources to respond to the crisis. Uh, in March alone, CBP apprehended and encountered over 103,000 migrants crossing without legal status, the most in one month for over a decade. On April 16th, we had almost 5,000 people cross the border without authorization in a single day, almost 1,000 of them in just three large groups. Remarkably, these three large groups in one 24-hour period exceeded the total number of large groups apprehended in all of fiscal year 2017. Simply put, the system is full and we are well beyond our capacity. This means that the new waves of vulnerable populations arriving here and exacerbating the already urgent humanitarian security crisis at the border, we don't have room to hold them, we don't have the authority to remove them fairly and expeditiously, and, we are not likely, and they are not likely to be allowed to remain in the country at the end of their immigration proceedings. The status quo is not acceptable. Through supplemental requests and emergency declarations, we have worked to do everything to address the immediate and dire humanitarian crisis that we can. We've deployed medical teams from the U.S. Coast Guard. We've received help from the Department of Defense and Health and Human Services. We've redeployed CBP officers, and we've engaged with nonprofits uh, across the country. But we do need more authorities, uh, as, as the ranking member noted, and more resources to definitively address the crisis. We need sustained investment and additional emergency support at the southwest border to overcome the humanitarian and security crisis that we face. The President's budget requests $523 million to address the humanitarian crisis. This money will allow us to provide better care for those who we come in contact with through apprehension, care in custody, detention, and where appropriate removal. Second, to address the border security crisis, it requests $5 billion in funding for the construction of approximately 200 miles of new border wall system. This is a proven deterrent that will enhance our ability to apprehend those entering our nation illegally. It also calls for 750 additional Border Patrol agents, 273 Customs and Border Protection officers, and over 1,660 ICE frontline and support personnel. We'll also make much needed upgrades to sensors, command and control systems, and aircraft to help our men and women combat criminals who are profiting from human suffering. I hear weekly from our operators on the border that these upgrades are badly needed in their fight against transnational criminal organizations, smugglers, and gangs. I would please ask for your support to our men and women who are doing heroic work along the border. While our 2020 budget will help address this crisis, we will need additional funding even sooner. Given the scale of what we're facing, we will exhaust our resources before the end of this fiscal year, which is why this week the administration will be sending a supplemental funding request uh, to the Congress. As I'm sure you are only too aware, DHS is not the only agency involved in the humanitarian crisis unfolding daily at our southern border. 
Our partners at the Department of Health and Human Services are also on the brink of running out of resources. The administration's supplemental request will address critical humanitarian requirements and help ensure the crisis is managed in an operationally effective, humane, and safe manner. The administration's supplemental request will not only provide critical humanitarian assistance, including temporary and semi-permanent migrant processing facilities at the southern border, where families and children will receive timely and appropriate medical attention, food, and temporary shelter prior to being transferred to other residential locations, but also funding for border operations to include surge personnel, expenses, and increased detention capacity. And finally, for mission support activities, including upgrades to our overtaxed information technology systems to manage and process migrants accurately, efficiently, and quickly. The supplemental request is, is part one. The second request will be the administration's legislative proposal, which will be sent to Congress shortly to address the key drivers of the humanitarian crisis. But even as we face a challenging border security and humanitarian crisis that is a central focus and my central task as acting secretary, DHS is always a multi-mission department and we will not lose momentum across any of our key missions and the numerous efforts that we are facing, including critically cybersecurity, securing the 2020 elections, preparing for the upcoming hurricane season and everything else that we're asked to do. The president's budget also requests $1.3 billion to assess evolving cybersecurity risks protect federal government information systems and critical infrastructure. The budget supports the launch of Protect 2020, a new initiative designed to get all states to a baseline level of election infrastructure cybersecurity well before the national elections of 2020, building on the progress we made during the election season in 2018. While DHS does not control or directly oversee state and local election infrastructure, we can provide much needed technical assistance and support to our willing partners. Our air travel system also needs to continue to evolve and upgrade in our security posture. Additional transportation security officers and technology will uphold our security effectiveness and stay ahead of increasing costs and security demands at airports nationwide. $3.3 billion requested for TSA includes funding for an additional 700 screeners and 350 computed tomography units. I want to close by reiterating that the strength of DHS is in its people. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the tremendous dedication of our frontline officers and agents confronting that, this crisis each day, and I appreciate the members of this committee going down to see our, our personnel, whether it's at the border, here, seeing our TSA at airports, just as you did yesterday, uh, and really getting to know the, the challenges they face and the way they're, they're tackling those challenges. Investment in our workforce is going to remain a very high priority for me. It was at CBP, it will during my tenure as Acting Secretary. I'm very glad the President's budget provides the necessary funding to accomplish our vital mission alongside funding retention and morale programs for our personnel. The resolve and devotion of the men and women of DHS is on display daily, and the security of our nation depends on appropriate resources to help them meet the newly challenging circumstances. Uh, as the committee knows, I'm two and a half weeks into this role, uh, so I'm joined at the table today by Acting Undersecretary Chip Fulgham, a tremendous professional who I've known for almost a decade, who has a multi-decade career of service, uh, both in the United States Air Force as well as the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, he's doing uh, this side by side with me in his last week at the Department of Homeland Security uh, because he's committed to providing this committee with the information they need to understand our appropriations request and to effectively assess uh, our budget. So I just want to thank you, Chip, for sitting next to me. I will definitely be relying on his expertise on multiple areas during our conversation today. So thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I look forward to the conversation this morning. Mr. Secretary, uh, as I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, on our trip to the border earlier this month, we witnessed migrants continuing uh, to be held in inhumane conditions. Well, we did witness a CBP personnel trying to manage the flow and improve conditions where they could. We also saw many inefficiencies among departmental components that are continuing uh, to uh, provide delays in processing, transportation, and in improving uh, conditions. What steps can be taken to improve efficiencies and the department's ability to quickly respond to changing conditions and what is the role of the interagency border emergency cell that was established in April? 
Thank you for the question. So I know you visited El Paso, Madam Chairwoman. This is our, our sector of the border that's had the most significant increase uh, of any uh, across the entire border, over a 400 percent increase in the arrivals of family units uh, over last year. Uh, th that has absolutely stretched our resources and our processes, uh, both at CBP and across our interagency partners in the immigration system. Uh, and we're taking a number of steps to address that. Uh, first of all, we appreciate the committee's support in fiscal year 19 to provide additional funding to address the humanitarian challenges. That means facilities, transportation, medical care, uh, and also uh, food and other care and custody support for those in, in CBP custody. Uh, we're applying that funding. Uh, we're in the process of delivering a soft-sided temporary processing center uh, that's going to allow our El Paso sector to put uh, families and children who are arriving in a more appropriate setting uh, during their initial processing at the border. Uh, that's absolutely critical. Uh, our second step will be to upgrade that with a more modular uh, and, and hard-sided facility. And then, of course, we'd like to establish a permanent central processing center in El Paso uh, that would provide the appropriate setting for families and children with, with a whole range of services, from medical care uh, to, to showers to, to laundry, uh, and, and really allow us to have co-located uh, partnerships with CIS, uh, with Immigration and Customs Enforcement in one location. Uh, that's the goal. Uh, but we're starting with a, an immediate effort uh, to provide a better setting uh, in our soft-sided facilities. Uh, you, meant, you asked how we can streamline these processes. Uh, I'd like to work on a unified immigration portal uh, that will provide uh, connection between the various systems of the agencies that oversee immigration and make sure that an individual being processed uh, can be tracked throughout the system efficiently and in an expedited manner uh, to both improve our processing and improve the integrity uh, of the system. Uh, and then I, m I mentioned the critical element of co-location. Uh, we're working closely, obviously, within the DHS family across the three immigration bureaus. Working with Health and Human Services has got to be a, a, a very streamlined process so that unaccompanied children spend as little time as possible uh, at the border in a border patrol station or, or a related facility. Uh, but, but also working closely with our immigration courts uh, at the Executive Office of Immigration Review. That we can do through improved communication, better IT systems, uh, and a unified approach to this challenge. But we have a lot of work to do, as you've, as you've seen, uh, and I'm personally committed to ensuring that the facility conditions are appropriate for those crossing the border. Okay, and, and the role of the interagency border emergency cell is? Sure. Uh, the, the, main, the main function of the IBEC uh, was to, it's the interagency border emergency cell, was to identify those interagency requirements to immediately respond to the humanitarian challenge at the border. Uh, so they've helped refine th those exact same uh, categories of needs, facilities, transportation, medical care. How do we get volunteers uh, down to the border from other DHS components that have skill sets that we need? For instance, driver's license, commercial driver's license. Uh, we have, uh, when we have uh, conveyances that we need to, to move migrants that are crossing, we don't always have the people to drive them. Uh, so simple things like that. We have attorneys surging to the border to help uh, process expeditiously and fairly, as, as, you, as you noted, uh, which is critical. Uh, and so they've developed those requirements, which we've gone to our interagency partners, including the Department of Defense, uh, to help us meet in the near term. Okay. And, and let me just, just say that, um, you know, the administration you have, have for some time called uh, upon uh, Congress to take immediate action, and we have not received any requests from you in, in uh, that regard. So I'm happy that you have stated it, uh, that we will be receiving a request <coughs> from you. And my time is up, and so I would like to turn it over to uh, Mr. Fleischman. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. McAleenan, much has been made about building a barrier across the southwest border of the country. So I have some very pointed questions. A barrier was not an invention of the previous Congress or even this current administration. Is that correct, sir? That's correct. How many miles of fence or barrier were constructed prior to January 2017, sir? Approximately 654 miles. Thank you, sir. The fiscal year 2018 Border Security Impro Improvement Plan was mandated in the Fiscal 18 Appropriations Bill. We've heard from you in your capacity as the Commissioner of CBP that this plan was the result of the experiences and needs of agents and officers on the ground at the border. How was the plan created, 
and who had input to determine the priority, sir? Yeah, that, that's correct, Congressman. Our, our border security improvement plan is derived from the men and women in the field identifying those technologies and capabilities they need to enhance the security of the border in their areas. As you know from visiting us on the border, each area of the border has different challenges, both in terms of terrain, in terms of existing technology, in terms of what barriers we have. Uh, and so our, our sector chiefs on the Border Patrol side, our, our directors of field operations are, are putting their requirements forward for what they need in their areas of responsibility. Uh, we go through a rigorous process to assess and analyze those, to validate them, uh, and then combine them before we submit the report to Congress on the Border Security Improvement Plan. Yes, sir. So just to be abundantly clear, the input is coming from the men and women who are actually doing the work there on the ground, and that's what you are acting upon, sir. That's correct. Very good. Is CPB following the published 2018 Border Security Improvement Plan when determining where to invest construction funds? Yes. Any deviations? I mean, that, that's our set of priorities that we're asking for funding against. Uh, and so that, that's going to be our, our, our guidepost. Thank you. Is CBP following the restrictions in the fiscal 2019 bill placed on various sections of the border when determining where to invest construction funds? Yes, very, very carefully. We'll be engaging in the consultation required. We'll be obviously uh, mindful of those areas where we're, we're not going to be able to build barrier at this time. Uh, but of course, we'll be following those restrictions. So you have been following the fiscal 18 and fiscal 19 restrictions as is laid out by the Congress? Yes, Congressman. Thank you, sir. So even though the President has transferred other funds, you're still following the priorities and plans in the published document and the restrictions of the fiscal 19 bill? Yes, that is our intent. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move to hiring then, sir. Uh, staffing and retention initiatives are highlighted across many, if not almost all, the Department's components in the 2020 budget request, with funds requested to back up increased numbers. For Customs and Border Protection, prior year budgets have also proposed increasing the amount of agents, just like this year, but the Department hasn't been able to provide justification supporting the request. The Committee directed the Department to complete the long overdue staffing report by September of this year. Further, the IG has recently published reports highlighting other challenges CPB faces to onboarding a large number of people in a short period of time, such as training facility limitations and capacity issues in existing agency offices. I have a question, sir. Has the CBP made progress on a border, border agent staffing methodology, sir? Yes, uh, we, we have. The personnel requirements determination, as you noted, uh, will be delivered to Congress by the end of this fiscal year. Okay. Does the model you're developing support the request of 750 additional border agents in 2020, sir? Yes, it'll support probably more than that, but that's the number that we, we believe we can hire within a fiscal year. And one final question, how will the department resolve other issues of training and facility capacity to meet the influx of new hires? Yeah, that's it's a close partnership between U.S. Customs and Border Protection and the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. Uh, and th we've worked that out in our officer context where we're, we're uh, enjoying a very successful set of hiring, uh, five, you know, 2,000 over the last five years at net CBP officers, and we're going to hire a net 1,000 or more uh, this fiscal year. Uh, so we work to balance the classes at the, at the FLETC Training Center, and we'll be doing that for the Border Patrol Academy as we seek to, to add additional agents as well. Thank you, sir. And as I said in my opening statement, I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Fulgham, and also the outstanding men and women uh, who work in Homeland Security every day to keep our great nation safe. And with that, I will yield back. Thank you. Ms. Lowy. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to welcome again the Secretary, who's taking on a really important uh, responsibility. Mr. Secretary, as you know, the Migrant Protection Protocols program was put in place to return arriving migrants to Mexico while their immigration claims are processed. It's not clear to me how this program works, and DHS has only recently begun to provide limited details to Congress. This is despite the fact that the program has now expanded to other areas, and I understand El Paso is one of those areas. Given that the program is called Migrant Protection Protocols, how does the Department of Homeland Security coordinate with Mexico 
to ensure the safety and well-being of returned migrants? And will the Executive Office for Immigration Review prioritize these cases, or will migrants be forced to remain in Mexico for possibly years as they await adjudication of their cases? Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. So the migrant protection protocols are an important effort to provide greater access uh, to court hearings, uh, and especially at our ports of entry where we're working diligently to provide access to asylum seekers lawfully uh, presenting without documents, uh, but also to, to achieve a, a actual court resolution in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, th this is something that I think is the fundamental challenge we face with the system right now, is actually getting results from an immigration proceeding that can be effectuated in a timely manner. Uh, what the migrant protection protocols allow us to do uh, is two things. Uh, one, it allows us to take more people in at ports of entry who are presenting asylum claims because we can process them without the, the limitations in our capacity from the custody requirements uh, or from the, the non-detained docket for the Executive Office of Immigration Review. As you asked, will judges be dedicated to the migrant protection protocol? Yes, that's our commitment from DOJ, that they will be able to dedicate judges and dockets to the MPP to, to actually get through hearings in months instead of years uh, before even an initial hearing as we currently face today. Uh, the other thing it will do is it will take away the incentive, which exists right now, uh, to, to cross illegally instead of presenting lawfully at a port of entry. Uh, we, have, we have increased our asylum processing at ports of entry 120 percent from fiscal year 17 to 18, and we are up another 100 percent in fiscal year 19 over 17. We're on pace for over 70,000 asylum uh, applications at ports of entry uh, in this fiscal year. Uh, to keep up with that, we, we need to ensure that we provide access to a process. Uh, in terms of working with Mexico, uh, we obviously had conversations before implementing this program. Mexico is a sovereign nation to receive people back. That, that is their decision. Uh, they made the decision uh, to accept them and, get, and put public guarantees over protection from a humanitarian perspective, as well as access uh, to legal counsel and access to return to the ports of entry uh, to uh, be brought to their court hearings. So just to clarify, because I appreciate your answer, you're saying that even though they're being sent to Mexico, they will have and are having access to legal counsel. So each, uh, each migrant and each asylum applicant is given a, a list of legal providers that are available uh, in many of these areas. And, and the main implementation, as you noted, is both in Baja California, or Tijuana primarily, as well as Juarez, Chihuahua. We have U.S. attorneys and non-governmental organizations that, that have uh, bi binational presence uh, and collaboration. And so we make sure they know who they can call if they don't already have uh, an attorney identified. Uh, and they, they have that opportunity to also meet with their counsel uh, when they come into the U.S. Uh, before their, their hearing as well. I would appreciate additional information as to how that uh, process is working and whether you think it's effective and whether uh, most or all of the migrants do have legal counsel. I'd appreciate that. Um, the zero tolerance policy instituted by the Trump administration led to the separation of thousands of families. And while this inhumane policy technically ended last June, as I understand that CBP continues to separate some children from their families. I know you describe family separation as not worth it. But can you explain the circumstances under which CBP will separate child from a parent, legal guardian, or someone claiming that relationship? Oh, I have, maybe, I, maybe you can just answer that. I see I run out of time. Please answer. Yes, thank you. So the, the conditions where a child might be separated from a lawful parent or guardian at this time are extraordinarily rare. It's happening for, for less than two per day, even though we have 1,600 plus families arriving per day. These conditions are prescribed both in the executive order uh, from uh, July, June 20th of last year, as well as the uh, Miss L case court order, uh, and they are for the safety and welfare of the child. Uh, a communicable disease, a serious criminal history, a, a risk presented by, the, by that adult uh, to the child. And so it's, it's being done very carefully, in extraordinarily rare circumstances, uh, and that's, that's the only time a separation occurs. 
Uh, the other part of your question, though, is when a family member crosses with a child. Under the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act, a, a family unit is defined as a parent or guardian, uh, not necessarily just another family member. Uh, so in those cases, we do have to treat the child as unaccompanied as well under the law. To be continued. I know I've run out of time. Thank you, sir. Ms. Granger. Thank you. Uh, because of the sheer volume of people coming uh, to the border to claim asylum and the resulting strain on the immigration system, record numbers of migrants are being released into the United States with court dates and directions to check in with their local ICE offices. Many of them completely ignore those instructions. I heard on one trip to the border that monitoring bracelets were removed as soon as the migrants left law enforcement custody in many cases. We've invested billions of dollars in alternatives to detention. I'd ask you, do, do these programs work? Which ones of them work? Does ICE have the resources to deal with the number of immigrants, both in terms of those presenting at the border and tracking people going through the asylum process? While this issue is mainly in the jurisdiction of the Department of Justice, do you have suggestions on how the immigration courts could speed up the processing and reduce their backlog? Thank you, Congresswoman. There are several important questions there. Uh, first of all, that's going to be an area that I look at very carefully, along with the Acting Director of ICE, uh, Matt Albans. How can we make our alternatives to detention effective? for ensuring that people do present for their court hearings and that those results that, that immigration judges uh, eventually find can be appropriately effectuated. Uh, we do not have that process working effectively right now, as you noted. Uh, we are very concerned about uh, people cutting off their bracelets and not showing up for court hearings. Uh, that, that's not a, a process with integrity right now. Uh, we do recognize the committee's uh, provision of additional resources in fiscal year 19 uh, to look at a, a case management program in a, in a renewed light uh, for families that would maybe help us uh, ensure people actually go through the process in an expedited manner. Uh, one of the things I'll be talking about with Attorney General Barr and, and James McHenry, who oversees the Executive Office of Immigration Review, uh, is how we can move uh, people through a non-detained docket for those recent border arrivals in an effective manner. Uh, that, that's absolutely critical. Uh, but it, in terms of the, your broader point, the, the way that we are actually achieving results is when we are able to detain someone in custody through the pendency of their immigration proceedings. Uh, that's, that's what works with single adults uh, right now, uh, and, and that's an essential aspect of what we're going to be asking for from Congress for families, uh, being able to keep them together in an appropriate setting for a fair and expeditious process. Uh, that's going to be how we establish integrity for that uh, group of border crossers as well. And I think all of us that are on this subcommittee and, and all the members of Congress, we realize that there were good, good processes put together at some time. The sheer numbers today, we have new process and, ch and change those laws that are going to be very important. I was on the border on one of the trips recently, and, and the person that was working so hard and said, you know, what we need is a permanent structure of this. And I said, no, we don't need a permanent structure because we can't do this permanently. The numbers are so overwhelming. I, the, the Customs Border Patrol, they're like our military. They say, we'll do whatever, with whatever you give us. Well, they, can't, they don't say that anymore because they can't do it. And so we really, all of us, need to work together with you uh, and all that are trying to figure this thing out and how we stop those sheer numbers and how we deal with it uh, as we go. I've got a little bit of, uh, more time. Um, when, how would you, you've had such a long experience with this issue. How are you seeing the changes occur? And I go back to... For, far be before this started, something that we were watching so carefully, to back to 2014 when uh, Speaker Boehner asked me to go to the border and see these un unaccompanied children and what was happening there and make recommendations. That's when we made recommendations, and I went to all three of the countries they were coming from and asked questions of the administration there, and I said, do you want your children back, first of all? How much do you want your children back? And then what can you do in these countries to make them safer so that parents don't take their children to a country that they, they've never been to or pay someone that they've never met before. So how are you seeing this increasing from that time and also just in the last 
six to eight months. So there's been a number of changes. I mean, from that first year of crisis with unaccompanied children and, and family units, I was deputy commissioner of U.S. Customs and Border Protection at the time. And I think the, the main challenge we're facing is just the growing awareness and the exploitation of that awareness by smugglers of the weaknesses in our immigration laws and our system. Uh, we're seeing smugglers advertise differentiated offerings for getting to our border in an expedited time, uh, making very clear that if people cross with a child, uh, they're going to be uh, allowed a different process here in the U.S. And, and that's, that's been an invitational posture for the system uh, that's been overwhelming, as you note. I would commend to the committee the recent Homeland Security Advisory Council report uh, just two weeks ago. Uh, this is a bipartisan group of experts who wrote a nonpartisan report uh, that are out, outlined the crisis we're facing, the difficulty with facilities and just sheer volume and processing, but also very clearly legislative solutions that would address both the families and children uh, crossing, as well as partnering uh, with Central American countries uh, to create greater integrity uh, from the beginning of that process forward. So I think that's a very good set of external recommendations that really, in my view, accord with what we're seeing on the border. Thank you for reminding us of that. Thank you. Mr. Cuellar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I appreciate the work that you do. Uh, as you know, I go to my hometown on the border, so I'm at the border every week. I, I get to get together with uh, CBP officers and Border Patrol almost every week, so I know the men and women that work for you all down there. And let me tell you, they're doing a heck of a job, and I want to commend them for the work that they do. I also want to say also is that, you know, this uh, CBP enforcement action process, and I asked my staff to put this together, as you can see, Mr. Secretary, it's a complicated matter. Uh, it's a very complicated matter. Same thing for the arrest and removal process. It's a complicated matter. And I hope we can sit down a bipartisan way and find some ways to address this, including if you're supplemental, I wish you would talk to the Department of Justice, because we added 50 new judge teams. And I think it was two days after we did the conference report, they sent out a letter and said, we're out of money. Uh, because of interpreter costs. So we haven't hired any of the judges that we added. So we keep talking about adding judges, but there's a freeze on the judges that we just added in February. So I wish you'd talk to them and make sure they make that as a supplemental. Uh, one issue that I want to bring up is, of course, trade. Uh, every day there's more than $1.5 billion of trade between the U.S. and Mexico. As you know, you all moved 545 CBP officers down to the McAllen area. 15% of that came from the Laredo District, uh, which is the largest port. We handle, when you put it everything, seven out of every 10 trucks that come from Mexico, across Mexico, uh, our border is through our port of entry. Uh, you and I spoke uh, and uh, gave you five different ideas. Um, and I think out of the 545, you all have brought back 225 back out of the 545. I asked you to spread the pain um, and go, without due respect, naming any cities here, but any of the cities that, uh, you know, instead of just taking them from the border, spread the pain and bring CBP officers. I asked you about overtime. I asked you about cap waivers. I asked you about volunteer forces. Uh, and, you know, the recently retired uh, officers also, uh, Coast Guard also. Uh, and so I gave you different ideas. Even the public-private partnership law that I pa we passed some years ago where there are the private industry is willing to pay uh, to get some of this work uh, uh, process. We, we still, you know, we still need to do more, and I really would appreciate your help so we can get our CBP officers back. They should not be changing diapers. They should not be making food. Uh, I think that's, uh, you know, there's another way to address that. And this is why we requested um, in this new budget, and hopefully the committee will go with this, 1,200 new entry positions for Border Patrol and CBP, uh, where they can do everything except arrest people. But I don't think train officers should be changing diapers or making some of those uh, changes. I know that's important work, but, you know, the immigration issue should not affect the trade issue, uh, which is a very important part. So I appreciate anything you can do to bring back those officers. 
Thank you, Congressman. And, and obviously, I share your concerns about uh, law enforcement professionals, highly trained, working on, on care and custody uh, issues, and, and obviously very concerned about CBP officers being diverted from their port of entry responsibilities, processing that incredible volume of, of lawful trade, as well as their counter-narcotics missions and other critical missions at the ports of entry. Uh, that was an immediate term response uh, to, to a crisis in terms of the numbers in our custody and the time people were facing in custody that we needed to, to provide some support to our Border Patrol agents. Uh, that obviously, we needed to start with folks who were nearby. Uh, that's why Laredo and, and some of the other land border uh, ports of entry were most effective in that most affected in that first tranche. We have expanded, as you noted, uh, to additional field offices providing support. We've, we've advised stakeholders in the aviation industry for, for international air arrivals at the seaports that there are going to be impacts uh, in other areas as well. Uh, but we've done all of those recommendations, uh, increased overtime. We've we put in cap waivers. We have volunteer forces now deployed. Uh, and we are using we're hired annuitants as well. That's a bit of a process, but we're bringing on as many as we can. Uh, because we need we this need all hands on deck. Yeah, I hate to interrupt because my time and I want to stick to my five minutes. Uh, do you know when we can get our officers back? So that that depends on the flow, and it depends on on how successful we are in providing the the volunteer forces and our contracting time for bringing in some of these contracted resources. Will you to spread help? the pain to other places because it's not fair that the Loreto District uh, right. has taken fifteen percent of the cut. Uh, or transfers, and I really would appreciate your help on that. And we, we I'll are follow balancing. up. My time is up on that. We are balancing across field offices. Understand. Thank you. Mr. Newhouse. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Ranking Member, uh, and for also our chair of the committee and ranking member of the committee to be here this morning. Uh, Mr. Acting Secretary, as well as uh, Mr. Acting Undersecretary, welcome to the committee. Thank you for uh, being here with us today. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I want to thank you for your outstanding service, a long career of helping to protect our nation. I also want to thank you for your uh, stepping up into this leadership role, and I certainly look forward to working working with you. you know, I've been to the uh, border myself, both north and from the state of Washington. Also, uh, it's, it's an important part of uh, your responsibility, but also to the southern border. Um, and certainly I've, as well as many others, have seen firsthand the um, Certainly, the dedication uh, on the, of the people that uh, are protecting our border to uh, work uh, in as humanely a, a, a way as possible to, uh, as we work as hard as we can to uh, deal with the onslaught of people coming on across our border. Uh, it truly is a, a crisis in, in many ways. It's an impossible task, almost, that we're asking you to deal with. And uh, if, if we want improvements and changes, in my, my opinion, it's up to us as Congress to provide you with those resources and policies necessary for you to carry out this impossible job. So thank you for being here with us this morning to help explain what it is you need. Uh, as you probably know, in your two and a half weeks, you're learning a lot of things, but um, there are a number of reorganizations going on across the department. Um, I'm a representative of one of the national laboratories, the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Washington State. It has been one of the largest uh, performers of research and development for DHS across the uh, national lab system. And I'm uh, interested in how things are going with uh, some of the R&D uh, organizations within the department. So as, as you grow into this new role at DHS, could I ask you your perspective uh, at this point on how the reorganizations are going in the science and technology uh, directorate and with the merger of the Domestic Nuclear Detection Office and the Office of Health Affairs that uh, will be forming the Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction uh, Office. So could you, could you give us some ideas about that? Sure. Thank you, Congressman, and appreciate your comments on the Pacific Northwest National Laboratories. Uh, during my career at CBP, one of the first things we did post 9-11 to increase our security uh, was to develop the capability to detect radiological and nuclear devices crossing the border. That work would have not been possible without PNNL, and I've, I've enjoyed a long-standing uh, partnership in my career with, with the experts at PNNL to help us uh, establish that capability. Uh, and from my perspective, R&D is absolutely essential. 
uh, given the types of threats we're facing, whether it's in the cyberspace, whether it's, it's unaccompanied aerial systems uh, that are challenging us both at the border and in security areas uh, away from the border, uh, you know, making sure that we're doing that effectively is going to be essential. Uh, you mentioned uh, both you know, S&T and our Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction office. Uh, I'm very excited to engage in this role uh, with, with both elements. Uh, s and has helped CBP uh, develop access uh, to innovative technologies coming from startups uh, out in the Silicon Valley area as well as around the country. And we're applying that technology effectively in months instead of years uh, due to the, the shorter lead time that their contracting authorities have allowed us to take advantage of. I know the benefits of partnering with s and uh, to create uh, b better uh, processes and better technology at the border, so we're going to continue that. Uh, on the countering weapons of mass destruction, we can't do this kind of work without a strong Office, office of Health Affairs and a chief medical officer advising us, both in terms of the care of custody of people uh, that, are, that are crossing the border, uh, but also think, you know, addressing things like the threat from Ebola. In the, uh, we've, we've done that before, uh, and obviously we have a new outbreak in Africa that we're monitoring closely. Uh, so I'm looking forward to working with these components in, in my new role. I've, I've done it for, for years in, in prior uh, positions at CBP and, and look forward to getting your insights and talking with the committee about how we can best manage those key resources to support the broader DHS mission. Good, good. I appreciate that and look forward to working with you. And I know other members of the committee are interested in this topic as well. So, but again, thank you for being with us this morning and uh, we look forward to working with you in your, in your new role. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Mr. Rupesberger. Yes, uh, Acting Secretary, first, um, you have a tremendous job and you have a very good reputation. You're a professional, you're focused, and you stand for what is right, and you, you know there are a lot of issues. Um, I just came back from a codel that the chairman put together from the border, and, uh, and I want to make a couple comments because I want to get my question and some of my observations. First thing, you have very good people working, wherever that is. I think the main issue at the border now is a volume. That, that is a theme that is, is really causing a problem. Um, and then, then when we have volume and people that are coming in and we can't take care of them, uh, a Border Patrol uh, leader said, you know, when you arrest somebody in the United States, you book them and then you don't see them until court. We arrest them and we have to detain them. And that's not really our business. And that's where we're having a lot of problems with this volume. So we've got, got to work on this. The other issue is that I wish our president would stop using this issue of the wall and the perception that everybody coming in or criminals are causing problems. Um, I think the cartels really are the coordinated criminals. It's a serious problem. They have a lot of control and a lot of money, and they have, they, they have the ability to get people in and drugs, as, as, as we know that. So it's a focus that we need to work on. And what you've talked about here today, if, if it could only start stop talking about the wall, I, I go to my district and people say, hey, Dutch, build the wall, support the wall. And it's really about border security. All you have to do is talk about the things that you've talked about here today. So I, I believe hopefully in the next year we can start working with you. And we need a reorganization of how we're dealing with immigration. Um, not only laws, but also uh, how to deal with, with what we really need. We need a thousand more judges. We need more people focusing on where we need to go. We need better equipment. And you're starting to do that at the border. Uh, at, at ports of entry where a lot of the, the drugs are coming in. So I just want to say that and uh, my observation, we've got a lot to talk about. Uh, Chairwoman, I really thank you for putting us together. It's, it's, it's really you learn by going to the front line, and that's what we did. Um, I want to talk about the um, non-intrusive inspection equipment. Uh, we provided uh, CBP $182 million um, uh, for, for this equipment in FY18 and $564 million in FY19. My understanding is that all of the funding is to be directed to the southern border. I support this technology and want to be sure we are screening all at seaports, including the Port of Baltimore, which I represent, where a lot of fentanyl is coming in, too. Of the $746 million provided by the committee over the last two years, how much has been spent thus far? What is your plan to implement and roll out NII technologies along the southern border and elsewhere. And given the NI's multiple platforms and capabilities, is CBP able to put additional capabilities at seaports? Uh, the reason I ask is with these if these investments are made and there is no question they should be, uh, what impact do you believe they will have on maritime ports and does that constitute additional investment um, in NII and maritime ports? There are so many other issues, cyber, that we don't have time to get into, but I'm focused on this one now. 
Thank you, Congressman, and, and I'll, I'll try to answer quickly to, to make sure you have a chance for a second question. But I won't. It, it, the support from this committee for, for our NII technology is absolutely essential, and it's going to be a, a tremendous opportunity we have to really change the way we secure our ports of entry uh, with the investments from both 18 and 19 uh, and the requests we have in 20. Uh, we spent about three quarters of the FY18 funding already. Uh, these are long lead time items, the, the new non intrusive inspection systems. They're tremendously capable, but they take about 18 months uh, from purchase to deployment. Uh, so we, we are progressing on an aggressive timeline. Uh, with the $562 million in the FY19 budget, uh, our Executive Assistant Commissioner, Todd Owen, uh, he's the guy who bought our, our NII technology after 9-11 uh, in, in two roles prior. So I have tremendous confidence in him uh, to develop a, an acquisition and deployment plan that's going to increase our mission effectiveness uh, in, in a cost-effective and timely uh, fashion. Uh, we're looking at going from 2% of personally owned vehicles uh, to scanning 40% uh, at our southern land border. Uh, those 2% of vehicles we're scanning now uh, cause 80 plus percent of our seizures. So we know we need to scan more vehicles. That's, uh, great. Uh, and for the for the commercial cargo, we're going from 16 percent to 70 percent, uh, and about a two and a half year timeline for procurement and deployment uh, at all of the different ports of entry on the southern border. Uh, for the FY20 request, I just want to emphasize uh, that's to recapitalize existing systems at seaports at northern border ports of entry uh, and, and ex ensure that we're maintaining uh, the, the highest uh, capable technology across our ports of entry. Uh, so th this is a multi-year effort uh, to make sure that we're able to do that, not only at our land border where we have the highest threat from counter-narcotics, uh, but also at seaports and, and, and northern border ports. Okay, thank you. I'm a, I don't have time. I just want to talk about drones in my next round. Drones thank on you. the border. Okay, thank you. Mr. Rutherford. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Acting Secretary, uh, thank you, uh, and thank you both for, for being here this morning. Uh, we've talked a lot this morning about the effect and the impact of this humanitarian crisis. I want to talk just a little bit about what, what I believe is, is some of the cause of this issue that, that you are having to deal with now, and that goes back to the Flores Settlement Agreement, which initially... Jenny Flores was an unaccompanied minor, unaccompanied. And the Flores Settlement Agreement dealt with unaccompanied minors only. And that they could be detained, the agreement was that they could be detained uh, as long as necessary. And, and that was the law up until 2015 when the middle district judge from California decided to expand the Flores Agreement, to include accompanied children. Not just unaccompanied children, but accompanied children. And as you said earlier, Mr. Secretary, the traffickers figured this out after 2015, and that's why we began to see these caravans of families coming to our border uh, in creating this humanitarian crisis that we're now trying to deal with the effect of. But... Uh, but I think we can thank Judge G from the Middle District for this and the lack of response to that decision from uh, Congress and the lack of response from the administration, not this administration, but the previous administration. And so I just wanted to kind of set the table for that because when I look at your budget, uh, had a, I had a lifelong career in law enforcement. I'm very familiar with putting together security plans, and when I look at your budget, I see a very well thought out plan here. It's a multi-layered plan. And the border security improvement plan, you have the impediment, which is the wall. You have the surveillance, which is the remote uh, video surveillance system that, that you're uh, asking for funding. You also have plans to build the infrastructure so that when a breach of that impediment is detected. You can respond quickly with those boots on the ground to get there and apprehend uh, those individuals. Now, my, my question, though, is on the, on the troops, the, the Accenture program uh, that was supposed to help you bring, I think we had 7,500 uh, individuals authorized to be hired. That from what I can see, Mr. Secretary, this, this program is uh, not working. 
Uh, now, if that's going to change, because I heard you mention some numbers earlier about up to 1,000 this year, uh, can you talk, talk a little bit about how well we can bring these people on? Because now we're asking for additional staff. And look, I, I, I know you need them, and I want to, and I want to get them to you. But I also want to hold this contractor accountable. So t tell me where we're at with that. Thank you, Congressman. If I could just respond quickly to your points on Flores, because I think that history is really important to understand. Uh, Congresswoman Granger mentioned the 2014 crisis. We had 68,000 families cross that year. Uh, what, what, what the Obama administration did was create family residential centers that allowed uh, C DHS to detain families pending an immigration proceeding, and then if they didn't have a valid right to stay, to remove them. As soon as those were established and re repatriation started happening, the numbers dropped immediately. Uh, that, that changed, right. though, a year later right. uh, in that uh, reinterpretation of a 20-year-old settlement to now apply to not only unaccompanied children but accompanied children. And that's the central challenge we face today with the families crossing. Exactly. And I should have mentioned also, I, I failed to mention uh, earlier, that that's where the 20 days comes from as well. Correct. That's correct. That, that's but, where the limitation to the, on to the on issue of hiring together. Right. Yes. So hiring has been my top mission support priority at CBP. It will remain that as acting secretary because it applies to so many of our components. Uh, you mentioned what we've done at CBP to change our hiring. We made 40 different process improvements during the, the three years uh, prior to, to uh, uh, my, my elevation to acting secretary. Uh, that, that had a significant impact. Uh, we, had, we hired over 530 officers last year. We hired 130 Border Patrol agents the first year that we ended the year with more agents than we started in three years, really kind of turned the corner on our hiring, and we intend to continue uh, to drive forward. The Accenture effort was an effort to try to increase the capacity to hire even more, uh, even more quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it didn't work out the way we intended. Uh, we did, however, have significant uh, d developments from that effort, uh, both with uh, r digital marketing uh, to find new applicants, with applicant care to keep uh, people in the system, understanding that where they were in the process. And we're going to take those lessons and, and capitalize on them. Uh, but we're not going to spend money that's not effective. Uh, and so that's why uh, that contract has been curtailed. Good. Thank you very much. My time has expired. Mr. Price. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Secretary, I want to add my word of welcome to that expressed by a number of members this, this morning. We do appreciate your many years of uh, career service with the Department of Homeland Security, and uh, I'll just speak for myself. I'm very uh, grateful that you're available at this moment to steer the, the ship. It's a critical time. It's a time of maximum chaos and, and political turmoil orchestrated by a, a vindictive president seeking scapegoats, it would appear, and shadowy White House aides and, 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 and much more. So I, my hope for you is that you cannot merely survive this, but that you can also uh, work with us to steer this uh, department back to a sane and defensible and balanced uh, immigration policy. Uh, in that connection, I want to ask you about um, the 287G program and ICE raids, particularly as they've affected my district and my state in recent months. In February, ICE carried out numerous enforcement actions in my district across the state of North Carolina. Agents, uh, agents arrested over 200 individuals in one week, many of whose only crime was to be here without documentation. These raids took place statewide in courthouses, workplaces, outside of schools, during traffic stops. The majority of these arrests were concentrated in areas that had recently ended voluntary immigration enforcement agreements, including two, several 287G agreements uh, with the agency. Now, I want to take just a minute here to quote fully your Atlanta ICE field office director. I, I, I'm going to quote him completely and fully. Here's what he said. I would say the new normal is you will see more visible ICE presence out in the communities. The increase in raids is a product of some of the policies that have been enacted within the state with respect to Mecklenburg County, Durham, Wake County, Orange County. I think the uptick you've seen is the direct result of some of the dangerous policies that some of our county sheriffs have put into place. And it really forces my officers to go out on the street and conduct more operations out in the community, at courthouses, at residences, doing traffic stops. This is the direct correlation between the sheriff's dangerous policies of not cooperating with ICE and the fact that we have to continue executing our important law enforcement mission. Uh, end of quote. 
Well, I, I, I was appalled to hear these arrests justified as, as the direct result of several counties lawfully ending their engagement in voluntary immigration enforcement agreements so with the agencies. And you know they're voluntary. Multiple courts have uh, ruled that these agreements are in fact voluntary to be entered or exited according to the best judgment, the discretion of local authorities. So that leads to my question. Can you tell me, is it department policy to conduct more enforcement operations in localities that have recently ended 287G programs? And is the department predicating raids as retaliation against local law enforcement agencies who are executing their own discretion and their own judgment and who have reasonably decided that maintaining community access and community trust is absolutely critical to their uh, law enforcement mission. Thank you, Congressman, for your, your kind words. As I assume this role, it, it, let me go directly to address your question. Uh, there, there's no policy of retaliation uh, for jurisdictions, first and foremost, and there won't be uh, under my tenure as acting secretary. I think what, what you're hearing uh, from ICE is their responsibility to protect communities uh, from those that are here without legal permission and have a criminal record. 87% uh, of those in ICE custody that they've arrested in the interior uh, have a criminal record uh, and a reason for that targeted arrest. Uh, they aren't ignoring other people they encounter that don't have a criminal background uh, but who are here unlawfully, but they are ap apprehending uh, prim primarily those who are here uh, unlawfully and have a criminal record, and I think that's an important aspect of their mission. It is also true that it is more efficient, more effective, and safer for communities if ICE can work with jurisdictions in the jails, uh, in the prisons, uh, to ensure that they're taking into custody those who need to be repatriated without going into the communities. That, that's a better approach. Uh, that's what we'd prefer to do. Uh, but when we don't have that opportunity, uh, they do have a responsibility to protect those communities, and they will do targeted uh, enforcement and apprehensions. Well, my time is about to expire. I've, uh, I've um, been informed this morning that we've, we've received a, a, an answer to an earlier communication that um, uh, I and other members of our congressional delegation sent uh, seeking, seeking clarification. Yeah, the, the, your, your answer is, uh, is pretty generic, and your Atlanta field director is pretty specific, that this is a matter of targeting jurisdictions that have, um, that have uh, ended, ended these agreements. So um, I hope it's not just a matter of straightening out the Atlanta director's talking points. I hope it's a matter of straightening out the policy and targeting enforcement actions uh, where, they, uh, where they should be targeted, uh, irrespective of the discretion exercised by local law enforcement officials as to, as, as, as to how best carry out their own responsibilities. So I, I do think that voluntary collaboration is always preferable, uh, as, as you outlined. Uh, ICE does have a responsibility uh, to do targeted arrests of criminal aliens in our communities, and there need to continue to carry that out. Uh, I don't believe that in this case, no, nor would it be appropriate for retaliation against certain communities. That said, if they can't do pickups at jails, they do have to go into the communities to do those arrests. Mr. Palazzo. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and uh, Mr. McAleenan, thank you for being here today, and Mr. Fulgram, I appreciate your time. Um, I know DHS is a, is a huge federal agency, uh, and you have a lot of responsibilities um, under, under your care. Um, so, you know, I had a breakfast this morning, the National Guard and Reserve Components Breakfast. Um, it's one of the largest caucuses that we have in the House, and um, something that you know, since I was on the Homeland Security Committee and now on Homeland Security Appropriations, uh, that I've always felt was a, a huge asset to DHS and huge asset to our nation was the, the use of the National Guard uh, and reserve components, but in this case, more of the National Guard. Um, you know, when we were having, uh, you know, we've talked about the shortage of officers and troops on the ground being DHS employees. Um, and, yeah, how do we fill those gaps? And I've always been a strong advocate of using the National Guard, especially after their decades of service abroad, surge into Iraq and Afghanistan, getting those countries under control. Um, and, you know, how, how could they be best 
utilized on the border. So I think you kind of know where my question is going to go here is, um, you know, how, how are you utilizing um, the National Guard? Um, can you do more with them? And is there anything that we can assist you as the Congress and provide additional resources? Because I do think they're a great plug and play, and they bring, a, you know, they could be a huge multiplying uh, effect to you while you continue to have a shortage of resources. And how are they helping your agency and your, and your um, employees do their jobs on a daily basis? Thank you, Congressman. I just have to say our, our partnership with the Department of Defense and the National Guard Bureau uh, has been just tremendous. Uh, it's been one of the key things we're relying on uh, to increase the security of the border as well as to manage the humanitarian crisis we're facing. Uh, a week and a half ago, I was in Rio Grande Valley uh, at a midnight muster, uh, and I looked out at that group, and we had obviously a lot of green uniforms at the Border Patrol Station, uh, but we had eight different color uniforms, uh, including a tremendous contingent of National Guard. And, that, and that's how we're getting a handle uh, on this crisis, both from a border security perspective and humanitarian perspective. So we've had them uh, alongside us on the border for over a year uh, under this administration, under Operation Guardian Support. Uh, what they're doing is, pro is providing the ability for Border Patrol agents to get back to interdicting and, and uh, stopping people from crossing unlawfully by increasing our surveillance capacity, uh, by increasing our administrative capacity at the stations, uh, and really that, that partnership is in, in, essential for us right now. Uh, right now, we're looking at expanding that uh, to help us with some of the transportation and logistics missions uh, that are critical to, again, freeing up agents to do their law enforcement functions effectively, uh, as well as just increase our overall capacity given the volume challenges we're facing. Uh, th that'll continue to be a, a focus uh, of mine at the, at the DHS level. I uh, already met with Secretary Shanahan on these issues, uh, and we're expanding our, our partnership uh, in the coming weeks. So I just want to thank you for your support for the National Guard Bureau, and, and we can't do I've talked to Governor Abbott about it as well. The Texas Guard is, is absolutely one of our best partners uh, border-wide, uh, no question. So thank you for that continued support, and we'll continue to rely on our partners. Well, that, that's good to hear. I think uh, Hopefully recruit some of them. It would be a great uh, group of individuals to recruit from. I know they enjoy the mission of helping to protect our homeland. After all, they're, they're willing to go overseas and uh, serve uh, to protect America. So just a quick pivot. Um, some, and I, the, the increase of hardened drugs and, and um, serious drugs that are coming across our border, not just through our points of entry, but in between, um, I know we have a southern border. Um, a lot of times we forget about our maritime border. But, you know, this committee hasn't forgotten about it. Uh, can you just tell me, I mean, with the money that we appropriate, you know, are you able to effectively stop the flow of, of the, the heroin, the cocaine, the marijuana, and the fentanyl, and all the other varieties of drugs that are coming across our border? And, and what can we, what do you need? I mean, is there more technology, more detection devices, uh, that, to whatever we can do to stop the flow of drugs from coming into America? and destroying our, our communities. Thank you for that question. Uh, quick summary response. In terms of the, the heroin, the synthetic opioids like fentanyl, the methamphetamine, which are primarily coming across our border from Mexico, uh, the investments this committee's helped us make in non-intrusive inspection technology, as well as border barrier and surveillance capability, is going to be essential uh, to addressing uh, those flows. And I think the, applying the investments that we've received effectively is going to make a major impact in the next two years, and we intend to do that. Uh, in terms of the cocaine flows, you're absolutely right. The maritime border is the number one battleground on the cocaine side, uh, and that's something with our U.S. Coast Guard assets on the surface, uh, as well as maritime patrol aircraft for both Coast Guard and U.S. Customs and Border Protection, where we're having a tremendous impact in the source and transit zone. Very concerned about increased production uh, in the Andes right now, uh, both headed to the U.S. as well as to Europe uh, and Southeast Asia. Uh, but again, it takes a balanced and integrated set of investments, uh, and the investments in the Coast Guard fleet uh, is going to be essential uh, to maintaining our capability in that area as well. Glad to hear you say that. Um, my time has expired, so I yield back. Thank you. Ms. Bing. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, Mr. Undersecretary, for being here today. Congratulations to you on, on your new role. I um, wanted to ask about uh, ICE arrests at courthouses. Advocates have reported that these arrests in New York State increased by about 1,700% in 2018 compared to 2016. 
Um, this is an astounding figure. In January 2018, ICE issued guidance, directive number 11072.1 on civil immigration enforcement actions inside courthouses. Uh, how many immigration enforcement actions that took place in 2017 and 18 violate this directive? And are any actions taken against ICE officers who violate this directive? That's something I'm happy to take up with Acting Director Albans at ICE and, and understand uh, their approaches in, in terms of following up on any policy violations. I'm, I'm not aware of any in my first uh, two and a half weeks uh, as Acting Secretary. Uh, I will note that, again, uh, looking for uh, the ability to enforce our immigration laws, uh, to take people into custody, especially who have criminal violations in a safe setting, uh, is a responsibility of ICE and something we need to continue to do. Yes, uh, I'm just going to what I know to be a directive from ICE about not uh, encountering uh, people within courthouses and in non-public spaces there. Um, but there are stories um, about, for example, in El Paso, Texas, there was a courthouse where a woman was seeking a protective order for domestic abuse. Uh, last year, officers arrested a Charlotte woman and her 16-year-old son outside a courtroom set aside specifically for domestic violence cases. So what is the priority in enforcing and removal operations? And how do you justify prioritizing the arrest of vulnerable survivors of domestic violence like these folks uh, over more serious criminals? I'm not going to be able to comment on specific cases here, but happy to take those back and, and look into them. Uh, but very clearly, ICE's priorities are to protect communities. Uh, they're to go after uh, criminal violators who are also here unlawfully, to go after fugitives who have been issued final orders and remain in the U.S., uh, and to in ensure effective immigration enforcement on recent border crossers so we maintain some integrity of the system uh, at the border. Uh, and that, that will remain the priority. But the directive is still in force, correct? 11072.1, and ICE should be following that directive, correct? I'll make sure we get you a briefing from ICE on, on those policies. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask about another uh, news article where um, CBP detained a nine-year-old U.S. citizen child who presented her passport. Um, she was detained for over 30 hours at a port of entry. Um, why was this child detained? So again, in terms of speaking about specific cases, happy to do that in another setting with a, with a privacy waiver. Uh, I can assure you that if CBP stopping a, a child, it's, it's for their own concern, uh, for, for their safety and welfare, for a concern about whether uh, what's, what's being presented to them is accurate, uh, not, not for any other purpose. Uh, but we'll be happy to give you a briefing. If, if you have a privacy waiver from the family, we can talk about the specific case in depth. I appreciate that. Um, how frequently do cases like this happen? I know you can't go into specifics, but just in general, how often are minors detained? And how long does it take or what protocol happens um, to confirm their identity and citizenship? Is it usually like 30 hours or is it less? Is it more? So it's, it's not common for children under 10 to present without an adult uh, crossing the border. Uh, and you, in, to determine who uh, should have custody and care of that child and to work with a consulate uh, can take a while, uh, but, it, but it's often done within a, a matter of hours. That, that's our, our strong preference. What we're facing right now, though, uh, Congresswoman, that I just want to highlight is a situation where children are being used uh, to cross the border uh, as, as purported family units when they're, they don't have that relationship. We've had over 3,500 cases this year. Uh, that's why ICE and, and Homeland Security Investigations have deployed teams to both El Paso and Rio Grande Valley uh, to ad address child smuggling and ensure that we're protecting children who are being used as pawns uh, to cross the border right now. It's a very dangerous scenario. Where would these children, I appreciate that explanation, where would children like this be held? Are they in a cage? Are they behind bars? Or what type of space while they're waiting to verify their identity? At, at a port of entry, I'm, I'm pretty sure they probably stayed with an officer in an office setting uh, during that time frame. And that's the protocol? 
that is a protocol uh, to, to take care of children in the best possible setting we can, uh, given the other challenges we're facing at the border. Thank you. I yield back. Before I go to um, Mr. Aguilar, I, I would just like to uh, point out, for one thing, with regards to what um, uh, Ms. Ming was saying, that could you give us uh, the percentage of actually of people who have uh, fraudulent documentations? My understanding that it is very <clears throat> small compared to the majority of those who, um, who come with their children. So I would appreciate that. And then also, just for a point of clarification, with regards to ICE and um, the uh, arrest that it is making, Nobody is objecting to the fact that uh, ICE will go after criminals who are a danger to our public safety. That is not the issue. The issue is that ICE has been going into communities, arresting people who are dropping their children off at school, who are coming out of church, who are not hardened criminals who present uh, a danger to public safety. And then when they do go after someone who perhaps, let, let's, uh, let's say, is a danger to public safety, that in that process, they also will go and arrest others who are not the target, who very often are moms and dads and folks who have been living in the community and contributing to that community. That's where the concern is and that's where the objection is. Not that ICE goes after uh, criminals who are a danger to public safety. And with that, I will uh, now call on Mr. Aguilar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you both for being here today. Um, Mr. McAleenan, earlier this month, Secretary Carson testified before Chairman Price uh, and the uh, Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development Subcommittee, and I asked him a question about whether DACA recipients are eligible for FHA-backed loans, and he said he was sure that many DACA recipients have FHA-backed loans and that HUD's policy on allowing DACA recipients to access this type of loan has not changed. Uh, my question is, has USCIS provided any guidance or directive to HUD staff without the knowledge of Secretary Carson possibly about the FHA program specifically? I'll have to get back to you on that one, Congressman. I, I'm not aware. Okay. Uh, my next question, uh, in January, the OIG published a report indicating that ICE fails to consistently include its quality assurance surveillance uh, plan uh, in facility contracts. Uh, QASP is critical to ensuring the facilities meet performance-based uh, national detention standards, uh, which require that detention facilities are safe for detainees and staff. However, um, uh, QASP was only included in 28 out of 106 detention contracts. ICE provided waivers to facilities that exhibited deficient conditions and did not include these in their contracts. Uh, between October 1st of 2015, on June 30th of 2018, ICE imposed only two financial penalties uh, for those not meeting the condition standards. In what circumstances are waivers granted and what types of, of these standards are waived? On, on this one as well, Congressman, I'll have to get back to you and get a briefing from ICE on the standards. I can tell you from sitting side by side with ICE counterparts over the last several years, looking at bed space issues, looking at expanding uh, contracted bed space available, uh, the, the standards both at the very beginning of that contract and um, repeatedly assessed are absolutely critical criteria that they uh, are, are uh, facing as they establish increased capacity. Uh, and from my perspective, it's, it's addressed very assiduously in their management and oversight. It's addressed in the sense that, that you're, they're trying to meet the bed space. I understand that. Um, I guess what I'm trying to understand is, is, is you are um, uh, going through that contract phase, it seems that um, based on these metrics, more waivers are being granted toward standards. So we're going to continue to hear stories about individuals um, uh, and facilities um, not in current standards if your growth is going to require waivers that waive standards uh, for this care. 
Actually, what I was emphasizing is that they haven't been able to take advantage of facilities that are available because they're not going to meet the standards. Uh, and seeing them make those decisions, uh, from my perspective, it seems like it's one of the main concerns in, in any sort of expansion. But we'll, we'll get you the detailed briefing with ICE. I understand. Okay. You're, you're saying that there would be more contracts if they, if they relax those standards. Okay. That, that, that doesn't quite mesh with... Um, 28 out of 106 detention contracts having this this waiver. It seems like they're doing uh, quite their fair share of of, uh, of, of waiving uh, things in order to expedite the process. But um, I'm happy to to gain more knowledge on that, um, Mr. Acting Secretary. In February, ICE confirmed it was jailing 100 transgender people in 20 different immigration jails across the U.S. Um, immigration detention is notoriously uh, dangerous for transgender uh, and LGBT individuals. Um, I, I sat with an individual in El Paso on our recent trip with, uh, with the chairwoman uh, who was LGBT, and he expressed that he uh, willingly uh, violated the, the work requirement. He was willing to work a lot more hours in the day um, just so he could, uh, because he worked in the law library and he felt comfortable there. He was willing to work more than 40 hours, uh, more than 12 hours a day, just uh, so he uh, could have that better peace of mind. In 2017, a congressional inquiry revealed that LGBT individuals in ICE custody are 97 times more likely to be sexually victimized than non-LGBT people in detention. Um, what steps is, in 2015, recognizing these vulnerabilities, um, uh, ICE uh, was allowed uh, issued a memo that entitled Further Guidance Regarding the Care of Transgender Individuals, which includes recommendations. Um, what steps uh, can ICE take or should ICE be taking to ensure that there's a minimum number of facilities um, uh, that are modified pursuant to uh, care under that existing memorandum? And has ICE provided any training or guidance uh, to staff uh, at these detention facilities? I apologize, uh, Congressman, given two and a half weeks in, I have not had the chance to go over all of these oversight policies with uh, my ICE counterparts here. Uh, what I can tell you is that for, for DHS writ large, protecting all populations in our custody is our commitment. Any type of sexual violence is unacceptable. It needs to be prevented, investigated, followed up on under the Prison Rape Elimination Act and so forth. I can tell you at CBP, uh, the, the sensitivity with these populations was, was taken very seriously, uh, including separate detention cells at San Ysidro uh, Port of Entry, uh, where we, we have a, a large uh, transgender population presenting, uh, as well as considering that status in parole decisions to ensure uh, people are, are safely uh, held. So I'll look at that with ICE as well. Uh, and again, maybe we could add that to the briefing that, that follows up on your first two questions. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to, and, and I think that, you know, that's the right answer. Uh, we have the right guidance here. Uh, what we need to make sure is that it's implemented correctly, and, and, and what we're seeing is, is that these things, uh, sometimes uh, that my colleagues have mentioned, uh, the implementation is, is the lacking piece. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Secretary, um, I want to share with you a brief story about a fellow South Floridian, Mr. Walter Goser. Walter moved to Miami from Peru in 1989 and got a job at a construction company where he worked hard to provide for his family. His employer was so impressed with his work that they offered to sponsor his visa. But the company unfortunately went bankrupt and Mr. Goser's application was consequently denied. In 2016, the company opened up under a new LLC and Walter asked his attorney to petition for his case to be reopened even though it meant having to meet with ICE agents who would monitor him on a routine basis. He kept up his end of the bargain and he checked in with ICE regularly while his case was being processed. Then in mid-February, without any warning or cause, ICE chose to arrest Walter during a routine check-in at the Miramar ICE facility in Miramar. ICE imprisoned Walter, a loving father of a family of four and a 30-year resident of Miami, in the for-profit Chrome detention camp, earning the detention camp money for more than a month on March 21st, ICE deported Walter to Peru, breaking apart his family and traumatizing his children. Now, I tell you the story because it's not unique. At my district office, we frequently hear from Floridians who have had loved ones under supervisory review torn away from them without warning or cause. So, Ms. Secretary, why is the administration randomly pulling the rug out from underneath immigrants and deporting those who are following the rules of supervisory review? That's my first question. How is ICE making decisions regarding who and when it deports undocumented individuals who are complying with supervisory review? 
And can you look into this policy and ensure that the Immigration Board of Appeals is amenable to appeals from cases like this, where undocumented individuals are doing everything they should and are deported anyway? And I have a follow-up question, so. Well, I would just offer that due process is essential in our immigration enforcement responsibilities, that it occurs uh, both with the immigration court system and in the decision making by, by both ICE and CBP. Again, I don't have the specifics on that case that you're asking about. But it, it um, happens every single day. Well, it, at, at any given time in my community, you have immigrants who show up for supervisory review appointments and have no idea whether the rug is gonna suddenly be pulled out from under them. So there is no due process. It, they're just arrested. So it, a supervisory setting is a much safer setting to make an immigration arrest than again being out in the community, which we've heard several concerns from some of your counterpart uh, on, on this subcommittee today. Uh, it, it is appropriate when there are no other forms uh, of relief available. Uh, okay, but my question is, how is ICE making removal. decisions, excuse me, how is ICE making decisions regarding who and when it deports undocumented individuals who are complying with supervisory review? I'll was, have to get back to you on that and offer uh, an ICE briefing on their, their policy for supervisory okay. review. I, I ple and when will you be able to do that? How quickly? We could do that in the next week or so. Okay. Week, not or so, please. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Secretary, my office regularly hears about community members being turned away. Now, this is specific to the Miramar ICE facility, which we've had very significant problems with after waiting hours in line outdoors for their appointment. They, they get on, almost no access to bathrooms, water, or cover from the sun. I've been there myself. Myself, Congresswoman Wilson, Congressman Hastings met with senior ICE officials at the Miramar facility and a, addressed these really horrendous conditions that immigrants are expected to wait in line uh, to, to, to maybe be seen, maybe not. They come from hundreds of miles away. Uh, my staff has visited the, the facility several times to monitor conditions. The last time they were there, they tried helping a gentleman from Guatemala who had an appointment letter, but who was refused to be seen because he had to first register by phone. An advocate, and this happens all the time, an advocate who went with my staff tried to call so he could get an appointment by phone for at least an hour, excuse me, at least an hour and a half, but she couldn't get through to a live person. Even more alarming, the telephone number that is provided does not offer an option to speak to someone in Spanish. Even if individuals get through to a live person, they may not be able to communicate. My staff has seen individuals come from Naples, West Palm Beach, Fort Myers, and Homestead. Miramar is in Broward County, and not all of them have a phone or a car, which makes coming to the Miramar facility a financial burden. The system seems designed to frustrate immigrants and make them waste time and money. Why is ICE making life hard, as hard as possible, and why have they not corrected the gross and horrendous conditions that immigrants are expected to be able to, to be subjected to? And when is it going to be corrected? Because I've already been promised that these conditions would be corrected, and they have not been. There needs to be cover. This is a parking lot, a very small parking lot that they stand in in the broiling sun, there is no water. They are not allowed to use the bathroom except occasionally in the, in the off office building. We were promised it would be fixed, and it has not been. When is it going to be corrected? I'll be happy to look into your concerns and get back to you forthwith. Okay, but I don't want to be looked in the eye again and told that these problems are going to be corrected, and they're not corrected. This is inhumane. Besides the fear of having the rug pulled out from under them for showing up and following the rules, on top of that, to bake them and their children in the broiling sun and not let them use the bathroom and treat them like animals rather than people is unacceptable. And it must be fixed. We'll get you a clear answer to your concerns, Congresswoman. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. That completes the uh, first round uh, of questioning. Mr. Secretary, let me just let me just say that uh, un unfortunately, uh, some of what was described by Ms. Wasserman Schultz is also what we saw when we were in El Paso: people standing outside in in heat, in the heat, um, and and just so packed that there was they they couldn't even sit down. Um, Earlier, in, in response to one of the questions, you mentioned the uh, Homeland Security Advisory Council panel, which recently issued a report making several recommendations related to the migration of families and unaccompanied children. The makeup of the panel uh, was not as balanced as it needed to be, since early uh, last year, a number of the Advisory Council members who could have contributed to such balance 
uh, resigned in protest against the administration's immigration policies. As a result, the report and some of its recommendations also lacked balance. And I have several questions with regards to the, those recommendations. Uh, one of the recommendations was to detain families for the duration of their immigration court proceedings while modifying asylum procedures so that a hearing and decision could be provided within 20 or 30 days. Um, I understand now that the, the president has now um, recommending a possibly a, a hundred uh, and eighty days, which possibly would be possible if they had uh, a, 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 a legal representation. But but based on the recommendations of the uh, of the panel, in your opinion, do you think twenty to thirty days is not enough time for migrants to find legal representation and prepare their asylum case, which could require the collection of documents? Uh, from their country of origin. So just on your, your first point, uh, Madam Chairwoman, I have full faith in this panel. A uh, tremendous group of experts uh, from both sides of the aisle, uh, immigration expertise in multiple administrations, uh, who looked at this issue carefully. Uh, hundreds of interviews, a pediatrician who's focused on the, the care of children in, in uh, DHS custody. Uh, they, they traveled the border, border wide. They're looking at ex expanding their effort uh, to go to Central America. And, and I do think their, their recommendations should be taken seriously by DHS and by Congress uh, because it's a really important analysis. Th this question is key. Uh, it's, it's key both in terms of the changes we're asking in authorizing law uh, for, for managing this system and restoring some integrity to the process. And it's key to understanding the intent uh, of the of Department of Homeland Security in this process. Uh, nobody wants to detain children, whether they're accompanied or not, for a long period of time. Uh, the notion that, they want to, that we want to detain them indefinitely or for 180 days, it, it couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, what, what has happened is that 21 days is not an adequate time period for a full proceeding with due process, with access to counsel, with getting documents from Central America to be completed. That said, we can go back to 2014 and 2015 when we did detain families through their proceedings, and the average was about 45 days. Uh, we're we're going to look at redoubling our efforts to make sure that that can be as expeditious as possible. Uh, indeed, even taking a fresh look at, at what can be done in 21 days with counsel. Uh, but the notion that we want to detain children for a long period of time is just not accurate, nor, nor would that be an effective way uh, to enforce the immigration laws. Um, another recommendation of the panel was to provide government-funded immigration counsel uh, to migrants. Would you support providing counsel to migrants to improve the efficiency of the immigration courts and to ensure that asylum seekers have the full opportunity to make their claim? That's something I would consider uh, under appropriate circumstances and we'll be discussing with the Department of Justice. Okay. And another recommendation was to require asylum seekers to arrive at the ports of entry while also ensuring the ports have the capacity and resources to end the practice of metering. Uh, do you think metering could be eliminated with sufficient resources at the port? And if so, will you work with us to determine what those resource requirements would be? I'll, I'll absolutely work with you to determine the resource requirements. Uh, we would like to increase capacity to process people presenting lawfully, even if they don't have documents at ports of entry. The challenge we have now is 90% choose to pay a smuggler and cross unlawfully between ports of entry, which overwhelms each component of the system that we need uh, to actually process those who present at ports of entry as well, primarily ICE and primarily the immigration courts. Uh, so if we could structure uh, both authorizing language and resources that would allow us to accept people at ports of entry safely, uh, that would be a much better approach, and I'd be willing to work with the committee on that. Mr. Fleischman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. McAleenan, uh, following up on Mr. Rupertsberger's questions, uh, we scan very few passenger vehicles that come into this country with non-intrusive inspection, NII equipment in order to keep traffic moving. But we know that the majority of hard narcotics come into this country, country through the official ports of entry, often deeply concealed in false compartments. I understand that CPB is exploring the deployment of a system that would enable the scanning of 100% of passenger vehicles entering the country. In the past, this committee 
has maintained a strong position of supporting 100% scanning, sir. When will this system be operational? Thank you, Congressman. This is the application of the significant investment uh, that this committee uh, made in fiscal year 19 in supporting our non-intrusive inspection capability at ports of entry. Uh, you're absolutely right. We have a very small percentage uh, of personally owned vehicles uh, that were able to scan with existing uh, deployments of technology, uh, less than 2% at the border. Uh, but it is our most effective tool in identifying those deep concealments of hard narcotics uh, crossing at our ports of entry, uh, so that we want to expand that dramatically. Uh, that 2% is targeted, uh, so it's the highest risk, 2%, uh, but we, we think we need to get to a much higher number uh, being scanned. Uh, with the investments uh, that this committee has, has provided, we think we can get there uh, in about two and a half years to scan a 20-fold increase uh, in crossings, uh, up to 40% of personally owned vehicles, which would be a dramatic change in our capability and allow us to target uh, really all personally owned vehicles that we think might present a risk crossing. Uh, as we continue to work with our trusted population at the border through the Sentry system uh, and our other approaches to, to manage risk. We'll also have our canines working pre-primary. We appreciate the committee's investment in the Canine Academy and providing different additional uh, canine teams out to the border. Uh, and, you know, really uh, the, the partnership with our investigators is what, what we're going to need uh, to continue to emphasize. Uh, all, all of these efforts at the border are our system. Uh, and CBP is, is the biggest component in DHS and, and the largest contingent of enforcement uh, at the border. We need that backing, whether it's from ERO for immigration enforcement or from HSI uh, for investigations of our narc narcotic seizures. So we we'll would like to continue talking with the committee about ensuring we have adequate resources throughout the system to effect effectively prosecute and resolve uh, those seizures as well. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. McLean, while leading Customs and Border Protection, you oversaw the innovative deployment of biometric technologies and specifically facial recognition technology to meet congressional mandates for biometric exit, as well as finding opportunities to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of your operations through these capabilities. These achievements have been important test beds for these technologies that can be utilized in other applications with both within CBP and throughout DHS. How do you foresee the development of facial recognition technology expanding in fiscal year 2020 and beyond that for entry and exit at air, land, and sea border, sir? Thank you for that uh, question. And, and really, it, this is an area I'm very excited about, uh, both in terms of increasing our security and making sure that we can address imposter threats uh, but very importantly, facilitating lawful travel uh, into the country. Uh, we, we have a longstanding mandate from Congress uh, to conduct biometric exit uh, of those departing the country. Uh, for many years, it was very challenging to see how we could make that work within the existing airport infrastructure and within the existing process for boarding an international flight. Uh, what, what happened with partnership with s and and we had that, that question about research and development and how we identify potential innovations earlier, uh, with s and we were able to test every available biometric technology on the market uh, in a test bed site out here in Maryland uh, and determined that facial recognition uh, was the, the easiest to use uh, and with the increased accuracy of comparison was going to be effective for, for our needs on biometric exit. Uh, and as we started to deploy that in airports and we saw benefits, uh, we've seen air carriers board an A380 in less than half the time because passengers are able to use self-service uh, e-gates uh, as they board that aircraft. We saw that we could turn that around and use it on inbound as well. Uh, so we are deploying facial recognition uh, now at our, our major terminals on inbound. I just saw it in Miami last month. Uh, it's just making the process so much more efficient. We're identifying imposters, and we're going to be able to, to really facilitate that lawful travel in a greatly uh, increased manner. Uh, so we're looking at 97% of outbound air travel for a biometric exit in, in a four-year period. So that'll be by 2022. Uh, and then at the same time as we partner with airports uh, to put that in place for outbound, we're also adding it as a simplified entry option mm -hmm. so that we can increase facilitation for those uh, inbound and arriving international passengers as well. Uh, it's something I'm very excited about, uh, partnering with TSA. Uh, CBP is also going to be able to help enable uh, increased procedures at checkpoints, uh, both for security and facilitation as well. And, and that's something that with the acting deputy secretary, uh, Dave Pekoski, we're going to be uh, working on uh, to increase the efficiency of the overall system. Thank you, sir. Uh, Madam Chair, yield back. 
Mr. Cuellar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Uh, Secretary, I, I forgot to mention this at the very beginning. I really appreciated the trip that you did down to the um, valley uh, where you found some balance going down there because most secretaries just go and talk to law enforcement and won't talk to the public, won't talk to anybody. So I appreciate the balance that you brought there, <laughs> especially the humanitarian aspect of it where you met with Sister Norma. Uh, and other folks. I appreciate that balance. And I was there a few days after you were there, and I told them I have a lot of faith in the work that you uh, have done and will be uh, doing also. A uh, couple of things. I would ask you to follow up on the Stark County. As you know, I, we added language that would ask for some input. So it looks by coincidence that y'all had the eight miles that y'all were looking at, what we would get input from the local communities. And I believe the Stark County people came up here and met with your office and even the Laredo folks came up and they were saying, look, we're willing to do this. And what did you all do in Stark County? They said, instead of eight miles, we're gonna get rid of four miles. And it happens to be that those farm, four miles are within the city limits where the language applies. So it's, Looks like somebody's trying to circumvent the, the legislative language that we added that was very simple, input. Might be a coincidence, but I would ask you to take a look at that, number one, because, I mean, nothing wrong to get local input as to the design or the alignment of, of the, um, of the uh, infrastructure. Then the other thing is I was in Mexico City uh, with um, folks uh, from uh, Pelosi's office, the Ways and Means, we were there on labor reform, what the Senate, and they just passed it yesterday. Um, and I just happened to be with uh, Donatello Guillen, uh, which I think you know, he's the head of the Mexican uh, Migration Institute. And it just happened to be at that time, 1,300 roughly, mainly Cuban prisoners had escaped. Uh, he and I spoke, and I'll be very straightforward what I told him. I said, I think those folks that escape uh, should be reported to CBP as people that violated the law uh, down there in Mexico, and that should be taken in consideration when they ask for asylum, uh, my personal opinion on that. But I told them uh, they should contact uh, Homeland on that. Um, the reason I'm bringing all this up is because I think we need to give Mexico a little bit more credit to what they're doing uh, down there. Uh, and any work uh, or any help uh, that you can give them, because they don't want to be seen as doing America's dirty work, to be quite honest. But they are trying to do their part. Um, in talking to him and talking to the chief of staff for the president, uh, Mr. Alfonso uh, Romo and other folks, they are hoping that they can uh, detain and return 600 to 800 people a day. Uh, let's say 800 people a day, those are 800 people a day that would be coming to the U.S. Uh, that's about 24,000 individuals a month uh, if they continue to do their work. So I do want to see how we can help them, um, you know, in the humanitarian area, biometrics in the southern part with Guatemala. I ask you to do everything you can because, again, we have to give Mexico the credit that they're doing. And there are, unfortunately, some people don't do that. Uh, but I think you understand the work that they're doing. So I would ask you, um, one is the uh, language that we added in Stark County and make sure there's no circumvention. And number two is what can we do to help uh, the Mexicans? And by the way, I've invited uh, Mr. Guillen and other folks and they want to come here and certainly I'm sure you're going to meet with them. And, and I asked them if they can meet with some of the folks here at, at, at the Capitol. And again, thank you for bringing that balance to the board. I'm very appreciative of meeting with Norma, Sister Norma. I very much enjoyed meeting with the mayors in Rio Grande Valley as well as, as Sister Norma Pimentel and some of our NGO partners on the humanitarian mission. That's, that's essential. Uh, you absolutely will follow uh, the provisions of the law on, on the wall and the consultation with local communities, especially in Star County. Uh, we'll get back to you on any, any concerns on circumvention of that. Uh, you mentioned our partnership with Mexico. We can't, we can't manage a regional phenomenon without a, a close partnership with really the main transit country now uh, in Mexico. Historically, they were a source country of migration. Now, now they're primarily a transit country and, and uh, sometimes a destination country. So that's a big change in terms of their policy approach. 
Uh, I've met with Tony Tugian at, at, at NAMI uh, several times already in his tenure, as well as his boss, uh, Secretary Sanchez, and we're going to continue that, that partnership. Uh, six to, 600 to 800 uh, interdictions and repatriations on the Mexican southern border is an important step. I do give them credit. Uh, that is about 25 to 33 percent of the, the crossings that we're seeing daily from Central America. Uh, and, and really what we're encouraging is addressing the smuggling organizations that are, that are preying on, on families and children. Uh, and that, that's something that I think we have close policy alignment uh, between uh, this administration and the Mexican administration. Uh, we do not want people uh, to be paying smugglers. We do not want people to be in dangerous situations uh, trying to head uh, to our border. And I think that's an area we're going to continue to partner closely with Mexico on. Thank you. Mr. Rutherford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, Mr. Secretary, I want to go back to the um, hiring challenges that the department faces, um, because that's just part of it. After you hire them, then you have to train them. And I read in an, uh, one of the inspector general's reports that a lack of funding for training facilities has actually had some uh, negative impact on the ability to train, particularly to the um, uh, scenario-based training that uh, you're, you're wanting to move to. And, and I support that uh, 100%. In, in fact, I have in my district uh, in, in St. Augustine, Florida, your Air and Marine Training Center. Uh, and, and I believe that that is going to become more and more important to the, to the mission when, particularly when the, when the southern border begins to tighten up, we're going to see more and more uh, folks moving of these uh, transnational drug organizations moving to the maritime corridors. And, and so this, this marine and air training center uh, has some challenges. I, I've been down there and seen it several times. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just want you to know I, I'm, I would love to work with you to be sure that um, those men and women have the, the tools that they need uh, to, to be the best, uh, particularly in the air and marine uh, arenas. So, I, uh, Thank you very much for that offer, uh, Congressman. And, and really, uh, working with this committee and the tremendous professional staff that you have, uh, as well as, frankly, uh, in the acting undersecretary's career, I think we're, we're doing better and better at ensuring we're not just investing in one part of the cycle. Uh, and actually hiring and paying uh, a professional, but ensuring that they have the training, the facilities for that training, and the equipment they need to do their jobs. Uh, and I appreciate your comments uh, on, on the Air Marine uh, facility in your district. Uh, it is absolutely world-class capability. Uh, we need to sustain it uh, to, to support our men and women uh, coming into the workforce, going back for advanced training, training on new vessels. We do international training there uh, so our partners can be up at our standard. Uh, and I think that the, absolutely essential and look forward to working with you to make sure that's sustained. Yeah, I'd like to remove some of those workarounds that they're, you know, faced with. Uh, let, me, let me go to uh, 287G. A as the Chief Law Enforcement Officer in Jacksonville for, for many years, uh, I actually started a 287G program within our uh, corrections department. Now, I, I did not uh, implement the the street aspect of it, but we did, and I did want to remove those criminal, uh, th that criminal element of those who were also uh, undocumented uh, immigrants. It worked incredibly well. Now, one of the, one of the things that I hear a, a lot of people talking about, and this is a concern that I had as, as sheriff, and that is if you create this, this culture, this underground culture, of these individuals, these undocumented, uh, not only do they prey on each other, but they're preyed upon by others in the community. And we had significant problems with this in, in Florida. Uh, and, and so one of the things that we worked hard on was educating the public, particularly those illegals, about U visa and the way that they could use that process uh, to, if they were the victim, were a witness of a crime, and, and they were a witness that had um, direct evidence 
uh, that could help in the prosecution of a case, they were eligible for a U visa that would allow them to stay in the country. That way they could come forward with the information that they had and with no worry of being deported. And so that's a little known and talked about program uh, that, that I think is important to this population so that we don't create that, that subculture where they're victimized not only by others in the community, but by their own community. Uh, as we got into that culture, we found that, that rape and domestic violence uh, was just off the chain. And, and so I, I think it's important that, uh, that folks understand that they have that U visa capability at their, at their disposal. Thank you, Congressman. You've highlighted, I think, two important programs that we that we maintain, both the 287G partnerships in the correctional environment. Again, that's the most efficient, safest way uh, to ensure those that could threaten the community also here unlawfully are, are taken into custody. Thank you for your partnership when you were in Jacksonville. And then, and then the second piece of your point, the concern that uh, the, the most vulnerable populations in our communities are going to be victims. Uh, and, and really, the U visa is an, an appropriate tool uh, for that. And, and we do encourage uh, local law enforcement uh, to work uh, with, with us and the Department of State to utilize that effectively. Thank you very much. And I see my time's up. I'll yield back. Mr. Price. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, I, I want to raise an interdepartmental budget issue for you. It's one on which you've expressed very strong views in your previous position, but it has a new relevance to you now at the, at the secretarial level. Uh, and that has to do with uh, remedial actions with respect to the uh, flow of, uh, of migrants from the triangle countries of Central America. Um, Border Patrol agents, as you well know, ha are overwhelmingly encountering families and children who are seeking refuge from instability and violence and just a humanitarian uh, disaster in these home countries. They're uh, proactively seeking out your agents for help. Uh, this is a well-documented um, phenomenon. Uh, we, uh, we, we earlier in 2016, when, when this flow first started, we were able to um, increase support on a bipartisan basis uh, for uh, home country efforts to improve conditions and increase uh, security. And as you well know, this isn't mainly a border security issue, uh, militarizing our border or erecting a wall, that's not going to stem this tide of refugees uh, and asylees. They're turning themselves in. Um, our approach to border security needs to start 1,500 miles south. Now, you've previously briefed this subcommittee, uh, specifically on March 12th of this year, on just that, on how improving conditions in Central America is a key component in solving our own humanitarian crisis at the southern border. I, and, and I remember at the time thinking this was a... Uh, this was, this was encouraging. The, the, uh, the briefing addressed uh, what you called push factors and the care for vulnerable populations. And number one, you placed uh, the matter of support for Central American security and prosperity. Address the push factors, I'm quoting here, address the push factors by fostering economic opportunity and reduced poverty and, and hunger. Well, this administration hasn't gotten that... Uh, message. Um, in, in fact, the budgets each year have cut aid to these Central American countries and to the, and to the nonprofits and other organizations providing these services. They've provided, they've, they've proposed cuts year after year after year. In some cases, this committee and, I, and our, the State and Foreign Ops Committee has put the, put the money back. But this has reached a new level. And uh, as often happens, we've learned about it by tweet. Here's what the president said on October 22 of last year. I'm quoting, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador were not able to do the job of stopping people from leaving their country and coming illegally to the U.S. We will now begin cutting off or substantially reducing the massive foreign aid routinely given to them. Um, in other words, the experiment's over, I suppose, and... Um, and we're now going to punish these countries for not solving their problems and um, 
cut off aid completely. And as you well know, the State Department is now looking to suspend the uh, aid in the pipeline from 2017 and 2018 to these northern triangle, um, not, not to the governments necessarily, but to the, but to the uh, organizations doing, doing this good work. Um, so you can imagine my questions ab about this. Uh, does one department talk to the other in this administration? Um, do, do these cuts square with your previously stated goals of supporting Central American security and prosperity? Uh, what are you doing at this moment to make your views known? If, if your views remain the same, what are you doing to make your views known to uh, the White House and OMB and the man at the top? Thank you, Congressman. As I've told this committee before uh, and expressed uh, publicly at multiple points, uh, this regional phenomenon requires a, a multifaceted strategy that addresses not only uh, the border security uh, investments that we've talked about extensively this morning, uh, but restoring integrity to the immigration system and addressing those vulnerabilities in our law. Uh, th those are the two things that we control on the U.S. side. But it's also going to require our regional partnerships uh, to be enhanced. Uh, and that's with Mexico, as I just answered with Congressman Cuellar, uh, as well as with Central America. And, and I don't intend to stop working with Central America and have not been uh, suggested that, that I should. Uh, my first week as, as Acting Secretary met with the Minister of Public Security from Guatemala talking about joint operations against uh, human smugglers and transnational criminal organizations that are exploiting the Guatemalan populace. Uh, but I do respect the Secretary of State's views as well as the President's that we're, if we're going to provide aid to Central America, it needs to be targeted, it needs to be effective, uh, it needs to advance uh, American interests and actually reduce the, the root causes of migration. But it doesn't necessarily need to be zero. And we need accountable partners to make sure it's effective. Uh, so I'll, I'll be working within that process uh, to advise, uh, along with the Department of State, on programs that I think can make an impact uh, for consideration at the White House. And, and I'll continue uh, to give my best advice uh, to uh, my leadership uh, on the appropriate way to, to manage this, this regional problem and phenomenon. Thank you. It, as I don't need to underscore probably that this is uh, – uh, of course, newly relevant to you now in in your uh, role as uh, secretary, and I hope you'll uh, use that use this opportunity to uh, to push uh, push forward what um, what your view in the past has has been as to how to approach this challenge. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Aguilar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Acting Secretary, I wanted to go back to uh, child separation and follow up on Mrs. Lowy's question a little bit. You, you talked a little bit through the dynamics of when a child is still separated, um, uh, and you've talked with us uh, in multiple venues about that. The subcommittee's asked for you know the guidance that the field officers are using when, when that determination is made. Um, is there written guidance uh, and criteria that officers or agents use uh, when uh, a, a child is, is separated and there's the specific criminality that, that you talked about within, uh, within that family unit? Sure. I think the written guidance starts with the uh, President Trump's executive order from, from June 20th uh, of last year, uh, as well as the court order in the Miss L case, uh, interpreted and applied uh, to our field elements through uh, di operational direction at CBP and I believe uh, ICE as well. Uh, I do think as Acting Secretary I'll have an opportunity to look at how that process is working and ensure that we have consistent and strong policies for what is obviously a very sensitive matter that needs to be handled uh, delicately and with appropriate safeguards. Uh, so we'll make sure uh, to, to look at that across the organization. The executive order doesn't talk about the specific levels of criminality, though, whether uh, incarceration time is, is used, uh, whether length of time uh, is, is a factor, uh, violent versus nonviolent. Uh, which it would be important. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to ask is uh, you you have multiple sectors uh, underneath you uh, in that respect that could be implementing variations of the same policy. There's nothing written uh, that says what level of criminality, nonviolent, violent, uh, when a, a child is separated. 
So there is operational guidance uh, going out to the field on, on both components, but I, but I think you raise an important point because we're going to need officer and agent discretion in some of these decisions, right? An arrest for uh, child abuse uh, without a conviction might be more probative into that risk for a parent than, say, a conviction for wire fraud. It's got to be evaluated in terms of both the specific offense, the risk to the child, uh, and, and the severity in terms of a conviction or, or sentence. Uh, so I, I think, again, uh, taking an opportunity to look across the department in this new role uh, to ensure we have consistent and effective guidance is, is one I'll undertake. I just want to understand that your answer is, is, is you understand right now there is nothing written to that level of specificity. I, I don't know. I haven't read ICE's policies on this matter yet. Uh, I will. Uh, but I know that CBPs give uh, good guidance, but also discretion to the, to the frontline officers, and I've seen uh, effective implementation of that guidance. Okay, thank you. Uh, DHS, uh, next question, is increased the number of worksite investigations, <laughs> and in some high-profile cases, businesses were ordered uh, to pay more than $10 million in, in judicial fines. Uh, Homeland Security Investigations, EAD, uh, is quoted as saying, employers who, uh, employers who use an illegal workforce as a part of their business model Put, puts businesses that do follow the law at a competitive disadvantage. Do you, do you agree with that? I, I do. Uh, it's been reported that uh, there are multiple individuals who have worked for the Trump Organization uh, without legal status. Uh, can you ensure that the department won't play favorites on who HSI uh, is deployed uh, to in the business setting? So HSI's efforts uh, will remain targeted at the, the some most significant violators. They had a worksite enforcement operation that made 300 arrests uh, just earlier this month. It's a significant issue that they're going to follow up on to ensure we have integrity in the entire process. Uh, earlier this month, uh, Chairman Thompson uh, sent a letter to you about this specifically. Um, ICE isn't provided an answer. Uh, can you let us know what the timeline for an answer might be? For Chairman Thompson's letter on which issue? Yeah, this would be on HSI investigations and specifically the Trump Organization. I'll get you a response from, from HSI as soon as we can. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that there are 3,500 cases of fraudulent families, uh, and the chairwoman uh, asked for some important follow-up information, and, uh, and I also look forward to seeing that. Um, we understand that part of the issue is the definition of, of families you mentioned within TVPRA. Um, uh, can you give us some clarity on what fraudulent families uh, you're talking about? Does this apply to, to aunts and uncles, for example? Under, under your number of 3,500, would it be considered a fraudulent family if an uncle um, brought a, a, a minor um, uh, with them? Is that the largest part um, of the fraudulent family, I guess, bucket uh, that you described? So this is going to be an area of, of intense focus for the department uh, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, we're going to learn a lot from these HSI teams that have deployed to El Paso and River Andy Valley. They're bringing forensic interviewers. Uh, they're bringing biometric capability to try to ensure that we establish those family relationships with clarity. Uh, what I'm very concerned about right now, Congressman, is we don't have the time, uh, given the volume and flow, to do good interviews with each family that's crossing. And, and so I'm very afraid we're missing cases uh, where there's not a clear family relationship. Uh, but to your point, we need to establish a clear definition. We need to establish consistent metrics across CBP and ICE for capturing when that, that family relationship uh, has been presented as a fraudulent relationship. And that doesn't mean uh, a grandmother or aunt necessarily with a child saying, we're a family, and, and us determining that's not definitionally within the TVPRA, I wouldn't call that fraud. Uh, so I think we need to be very clear in what we're reporting to Congress, cl uh, clarify our metrics, uh, but also f have a significant focus on this with both CBP and HSI working in tandem to identify and address uh, people that are presenting as families when they're not, especially if they've brought a child across more than once. And we have seen that in a number of cases uh, that, that HSI is working right now. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, that completes round two, and, and I do have a, a few more questions that I, I would uh, like to ask. And I, I, one of them has to do with following up on what uh, Mr. Um, Aguilar mentioned in and, and, uh, an earlier round of questioning. That has, has to do with uh, the reports of uh, o, the OIG and the GAO reports that were quite um, 
damaging with regards to unacceptable uh, standard conditions at ICE detention uh, facilities. And uh, if uh, you read the reports, you, you can see that there are, is reasonable uh, concerns about the conditions at these uh, facilities. And the fact that uh, ICE continues to give waivers uh, to them. Uh, one of the things that was cited by uh, the Office of the Inspector General was that ICE has no formal policies and procedures to govern uh, waivers. And that I'm hoping that under your leadership that you will be able to uh, make some progress in making sure that they do create formal policies and uh, procedures to govern those waivers so that they're just not uh, haphazard and that we will have uh, an ability to, uh, to look at the waivers against those, those policies and, and procedures. In the uh, FY19 bill, uh, we provided resources to the Office of Professional Responsibility to hire new detention facility inspectors with the goal of increasing inspections from once every three years to twice per year. Uh, can you tell us what the status of that hiring is and when you think ICE will reach that inspection frequency and by when can we expect to see the policies and procedures that will govern uh, those issuing of waivers? Thank you, uh, Congresswoman, for, for those questions. First of all, we are hiring the detention audit officers. We hope to get about 30 percent of the goal in, in the remaining time in this fiscal year and then get to the full level that was funded as quickly as possible. I, I can tell you from the CBP perspective that, that there are a few areas that we worked more carefully to oversee uh, than how we care for people in our custody and, and what our facilities look like, both with the IG, uh, our, our Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Office at the Department, uh, with some of the court-ordered uh, oversight, as well as internally with CVP, the Office of Professional Responsibility and the Management Inspections Division, as well as hiring an independent outside auditor uh, to, to inspect our facilities uh, and, and make sure that we're doing it on a variety of notice and no notice uh, so that we can uh, ma manage those conditions effectively across uh, all of CVP facilities. I will look at the ICE policies. Uh, I'm not familiar with their, their waiver policy at this point, uh, but I will dive into that uh, uh, in my role. Uh, but uh, I can tell you that we are hiring uh, the audit officers that have been supported by the committee and we'll continue to prioritize that. Um, I do understand that, um, that ICE has been working to update its national detention standards. Uh, can you tell the subcommittee of the status of that effort and can you assure us that the new standards will improve conditions and not lead to the worsening of conditions at detention facilities? Because that's, that's a huge concern that uh, many of us have. I can assure you that they won't worsen standards of, of care uh, in facilities, but I, I will absolutely uh, work with ICE on, on any revision of their policy. Uh, you know, I can tell you that you know, the last five years have been a period of increased standards across the board for uh, detention and care of people in, in DHS custody. Uh, you know, that, that's something we'll continue to work on uh, from my perspective uh, in the new role. Okay. And, and my hope is that as those policies are being uh, determined that we, we will have an opportunity to see them before they actually are um, uh, instituted. We'll, we'll make sure to, to uh, brief your team uh, and, and you, Madam Chair, if you'd like, uh, as well as work with our oversight within the Department of Homeland Security, the IG, Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, to make sure that our standards are appropriate. Okay. Um, as you know, this administration reversed a policy that forbade ICE from detaining pregnant women except in extraordinary circumstances. Well, in ICE detention, we have learned that uh, the number of women who have lost their pregnancies have nearly doubled in the first two years of this administration. Medical professionals have advised uh, of the dangers of placing any pregnant woman in detention. Aside from the obvious answer, that we should not detain pregnant women absent or extraordinary circumstances. What is ICE doing to prevent this type of tragedy from occurring again? It, it's another area where I'll be working with ICE. I can tell you that medical conditions uh, of people in custody are taken into consideration, including pregnancy, including late-term pregnancy, uh, as a factor in, in whether to do a, a parole release uh, or, or to make a custody determination. 
Uh, well, health professionals uh, tell us that inadequate health care services have been a major contributing factor to these tragedies. And when we asked about a stillbirth uh, at the Port, uh, Port Isabella facility, ICE told reporters that it wasn't aware of any concerns regarding medical care of pregnant detainees and that still, uh, stillbirths are rare. And it's responses like this that greatly concern me and others because it appears that ICE is not taking these issues seriously. So I guess my question to you uh, would be is how do you plan to address this and what can this committee do to support your efforts in this regard? My experience with ICE is that they do take these issues very seriously, but, but that said, as commissioner, I focused on it. Uh, we got better at CBP. I will do the same as acting secretary. And, and then finally, I, I want to go to um, back to the uh, El Paso and McAllen uh, facilities where we provided $192 million for a new border patrol processing right. uh, center. And it was $30 million for improvements to the existing processing center in uh, McAllen. And it is my understanding that you are uh, revising the requirements that are moving uh, forward with these modular structures. So what is the status of each of these projects? And, and can you uh, describe how conditions at the El Paso facility will be different uh, than those at the McAllen facility? And what changes are you planning to improve the McAllen facility? Sure. So th these are the two major sectors that are facing the significant arrivals of family units and, and children, as, as you know, and you've been to both, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, so what we wanted to do with the Central Processing Center is, is create a, a central place where we could bring families and children to not have them in Borg Shoal stations. Uh, what we're going to be able to do with El Paso that's different than uh, what we have in McAllen right now is a purpose-built center from the beginning designed based on our lessons learned over the last five years with this new uh, phenomenon of children and families coming across, both in terms of how the interior is designed, how it looks, uh, but, but also for the functionality, uh, for the medical care, for the showers, laundry, uh, kitchen facilities that we need to appropriately care for families in our custody. So that's going to be different from the beginning. That said, we also want to renovate uh, the McAllen facility. Uh, we're going to take out the chain link. We're going to have partitions that, that are more appropriate uh, in terms of appearance uh, as we protect families in our custody. Uh, but we're also uh, going to ensure that, that the transportation flow, uh, both the ability to securely uh, move people in and out of the facility is improved, uh, as well as the shower facilities there. Uh, in the meantime, though, we're not waiting. Uh, we are using our uh, appropriated funding to establish soft-sided facilities to provide a better situation for families and children right now uh, in those two sectors, uh, given the ex extensive flow that we're facing. Okay. Well, we, we really do want uh, these uh, new processing centers to be, be successful. And we're hoping that uh, there'll be some creative thinking in, uh, in, in these facilities. For instance, could uh, you have child welfare professionals at the center and perhaps in the border patrol stations who could speak Spanish and have expertise in conducting forensic interview with, with kids? That's absolutely something we're looking at and, and did establish with, with our own operational funding uh, last year uh, in Rio Grande Valley. Uh, it's, a, it's a limited application, but we intend to look at all elements of care for those in our custody uh, to make sure that we're doing the best we can during that hopefully very short time there in a border patrol uh, facility. Okay. Um, another, um, I guess, idea is that because of the large number of uh, actually uh, migrant families that are currently crossing the border, CBP and ICE could have begun to rely heavily on nonprofit organizations to provide temporary shelter to migrants while they plan their next steps. Uh, would it make sense to have shelter representatives co-located at the central processing centers to help migrants start working earlier on their travel plans? That, that's a potential option. Uh, from my experience, both in El Paso and the Rio Grande Valley, the, the coordination and communication uh, is daily. It's, it's constant uh, to ensure that uh, the NGO community understand uh, how many people are coming through, uh, what requirements we might have uh, to safely manage that, uh, and to partner effectively. Mr. Aguilar? Yeah, I'll, I'll be that. I'll be that individual, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I, I don't want to stand in the way of, of everyone in the, the lunch hour. Just a couple quick things um, following up on, on TVPRA, uh, as we were discussing, uh, Mr. Acting Secretary, 
you had earlier mentioned that there would be there would be some legislative proposals as well that would be forthcoming uh, from the department. Uh, will changes that that you're proposing to TVPRA? I know that's been a talking point that I've seen out of the administration. Will that include redefining um, a family unit um, uh, to be more expansive to include aunts, uncles, uh, grandparents? I think that's that's something we could discuss uh, with Congress in, in the context of improving uh, TVPRA to to eliminate the double standard that now applies for uh, unaccompanied children coming from contiguous countries, Mexico and Canada, uh, versus non-contiguous countries. Uh, you know, we've heard from the governments of Central America saying that we have an interest in our unaccompanied children who have made their trek to the border. We'd like to be able to provide a safe return for them but it's not provided for right now under the TVPRA. That's something we'd like to work on with Congress. But other changes recommended by members of Congress, that's absolutely the dialogue that we want to start so that we can talk about addressing this problem together and making effective changes to the law uh, to, to respond to the flows that we're seeing today. But you're talking about the contiguous, non-contiguous. That's what we can expect to see out of the legislative proposal. Um, uh, not putting words into your mouth, um, not that you would be close to those other changes, but you wouldn't uh, be proposing any of those in this legislative package. Yeah, the focus is addressing the, the situation where there's an incentive to cross as an unaccompanied child with certainty that you'll be allowed to stay. Sure. Uh, and, and that's what's, what's causing children to, to get into the hands of smugglers for thousands of dollars to be spent with criminal organizations to come to our border. Uh, that's what we're primarily trying to address I, with the proposal. I wasn't here in, in Congress at the time, but it, TVPRA was passed uh, almost unanimously, I think, uh, within the House and Senate. So I look forward to seeing uh, your, your legislative uh, recommendations. And, and uh, could I just add, Congressman, that the protections in TVPRA against trafficking of children are essential, and, and we would like to preserve those, uh, and as well as the conditions and timelines for custody of children. It, there's no recommended change to any of those elements. Look forward to, to seeing the language. Um, Mr. Secretary, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus uh, was in contact with uh, DHS about uh, the secretary, uh, the prior secretary, uh, visiting uh, for a discussion, uh, and the date was set for May 23rd. I don't want to bind you to your uh, predecessor's uh, calendar, uh, but would you be open to, to keeping this date or to, or to working uh, to have a meeting with the Congressional Hispanic Caucus uh, sometime uh, in the next uh, four to six weeks? So one of my top priorities in this role is to have dialogue with members of Congress who are worried about these problems and willing to come together to try to come up with common solutions to them. So I'll continue to be open to engaging. I don't know about that particular date. I'm not in charge of my own calendar. Uh, but, I understand but, the feeling. But yes, um, I would like to engage with you and other members of the CHC, no question. Absolutely, I, I appreciate it. Um, my last question was, was just getting a little more clarity on the NII. Um, uh, that you mentioned, 2% uh, of passenger, you said ramping up to 40% uh, by what year? 2021. And then the commercial you mentioned was 16% going to 70%? Correct. But in the same? Same time frame. Same and, time and we're going to present a, a full spend plan and program uh, to the committee uh, in, in the coming months. I, I appreciate uh, the, the added um, uh, questions, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Acting Secretary. Thank you. But let me just say that, that uh, the Secretary has actually been proactive in asking uh, for meetings, not only with the Hispanic Caucus, but other uh, stakeholders, and we'll be uh, making those arrangements. Thank you. Uh, also, uh, I'm sure you've noticed that we have a lot of uh, issues, a lot of concerns and questions about what is happening at ICE. So I'm hoping that once you're able to be better briefed on, on ICE and uh, the concerns that have been raised that we will be able to have another uh, meeting. So if there are uh, no more questions, uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank Mr. Fuljim for his service to our country over the last 34 years as he prepares to move on to a new challenge. After serving 28 years in the Air Force, Chip joined DHS in 2012 as the Budget Director. He was later confirmed by the Senate to serve as the department's chief financial officer. And I note that he was the last confirmed CFO for DHS. He has since served as the deputy undersecretary for management, the acting secretary for management twice, and the acting deputy secretary twice. Chip, I thank you for the management acumen you brought to the department over the last six years. 
Uh, in these last few years, we have seen a significant maturation of the department's planning and resource utilization. Most of those efforts have your fingerprints all over them, including a complete restructuring of the department's appropriations account. The department simply would not be where it is today without your six years of strong leadership. I truly wish you the best as you head to Texas to start your new endeavor as the chief operating officer for a nonprofit organization. Best of luck, and if there are no other comments, we will conclude today's hearing. Thank you, Mr. Thank Secretary. you, Madam Chairman. And he's a great guy, too.